Well, then we're coming from Liberty. Well, then we're on the north side. No, no. That's not how that works. Yeah, we're on the north side. Yeah, that's not how seniors who did senior projects. Um, I don't know the order of these, so we're just going to go the order that they were handed to me. First one is Benjamin Clarkson. <laughs> I don't believe Taylor Reese is here, but she was one of the top five. Benjamin Ivins. <laughs> Martin Leia. And Justin Cheney. I want to congratulate all of them. I know that was a lot of hard work and a lot of time put in, and, and I suppose you all did a wonderful job. Um, in fact, we're going to get to see Ben Ivins uh, present to us right now, I believe. So, Ben, uh, take it away. Sorry, but my preparation this evening was a little rushed. I'm actually on break from work right now. <laughs> but uh, my project was over the cost of consumerism. So imagine this. You're coming home from work like I will be in a couple hours at about 9.30. You go about 65 mile an hour down the four lane, and something catches your eye down on your dash. What you see is the dreaded old orange check engine light. So, at this point, you're faced with the question of, should you pull over, should you limp at home, should you just go full speed and keep on going, or should you go ahead and call that tow truck now? I'm Ben Ivins, and I'm here to talk to you about the cost of consumers. In this instance specifically, I was faced with a check engine light, and my decision was to avoid the cost of consumerism and save monetary value, which was money. And I bought a $40 code reader, which told me, that I needed an $11 fuel filter instead of paying about 200 bucks to have some shop diagnose it and replace an $11 oil filter for 60 or $70. I paid $40 plus $11 for the filter and did it myself. There are many ways in which consumerism costs us as people in the everyday community. One of which is the right to repair. Every day, as more and more people pay for convenience and just to have a shop do it rather than spend their own time and hard work, companies chip away and make it more expensive for you to do it yourself or try and completely blockade you from doing it yourself. Instances of this include John Deere and Apple. Apple has had certain times where they've implemented specific screws or software that blocks you from repairing it yourself Specifically, their biggest failure being the battery, in which when you replace the battery, you have to take the phone to an Apple store and they replace the phone completely at your cost. At, uh, John Deere also does this. There was a case in Nebraska where a farmer named Guy Johnson was charged $3,500 for them to read his tractor three days later than he needed for a crop harvest, just to tell him that he had water in the diesel exhaust fluid matter that could be solved simply by draining the tank and refilling it with diesel exhaust fluid. Cost him $3,500 and three days worth of crop harvesting. Companies do this so that they can make more money and it's simple extortion in my opinion and I believe that it should be stopped and it will be stopped whenever people quit paying for convenience and do it themselves. The way John Deere goes about this is they claim that it's their intellectual property. The tractors that they sell have their own software that they use for GPS location and autonomous running. And they claim that the owner does not really own the tractor, but rather that they lifetime lease it. And this is how they go about charging people insane amounts of money just for simple repairs such as water in the diesel exhaust fluid. Additionally, it saves you monetary value such as it did in my case. 
In my case, I paid forty dollars for a code read and eleven dollars for a filter instead of paying a crazy amount to have a shop do such a small repair. Simple stuff such as repairing this and changing your own oil and doing general maintenance save you large amounts of money in everyday life, such as it did with my project in which I built an eight foot flatbed trailer and saved about seven to eight hundred dollars. General vehicle maintenance and small products like this are ways that everybody can quit paying and they will realize the benefits of doing it yourself and the real cost of consumerism in everyday life. Additionally, whenever you do a project yourself, such as changing your own oil or replacing a fuel filter or building your own trailer, you have your own quality control standards that you can set. You can make sure that every bead on this trailer, such as the one I built, is up to your spec and that it won't fall apart going down the road. You can make sure that you tighten the oil filter to your liking and that it will not leak whenever you drive down the road. And simple matters such as this, the fine small details that matter in everyday life, you can assure that you did properly. Furthermore, whenever you do a project yourself, you can go about choosing the method. Here you can see where I'm welding on the trailer. I chose the method of using stick arc welding and using 7018 rods. This allowed me to have 70,000 PSI of tensile pressure at every joint on this trailer and is part of why I trust it to go down the road every day. Furthermore, I chose the plans for this trailer and here you can see them. They're really rather basic, but Miss Amanda Redviello here and her husband were my mentors and Nicholas helped me and walked me through this building of the trailer plans. And while they were simple, they were structurally rigid, rigid and allowed the trailer to roll down the road with no problems and support more than 3,500 pounds. Many benefits to doing it yourself include saving money, providing structural advantages such as both in my case, and it gave me a sense of pride. It let me know that whenever I built it, I had built this trailer and that I could pull it down the road and I could pull it across this country and know that I built that trailer and I was proud enough to haul it anywhere with anything on it. My product was an eight foot flatbed trailer with a three foot by four foot drop down gate on the rear end in which I salvaged the axle and paid for the rest of the parts out of pocket. I used this for hauling stuff such as our John Deere Gator, four wheelers that I often repair and lawnmowers back and forth from my grandmother's house to our house as I mow our lawn just about every weekend. I built this trailer completely from scratch using material from Pipes Plus in Pomona, Missouri, which cost me about $365. Here you can see this is the trailer after I had completed the frame, but before I had laid the floorboards and put the rear ramp on the back. Here you can see my materials list, which I chose. The only things that I did not buy from Pipes Plus were the trailer jack and the hitch receiver, which I welded to the frame afterwards. Here you can see what I pulled home from Pipes Plus, and here you can see what I turned it into within a matter of a few weeks with a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of know-how. Challenges that I ran into in this project were mainly welding, because until I tackled this project, I had not welded since eighth grade year, and every weld that I put down on a piece of sheet metal looked about like a bunch of grapes. <laughs> I stuck the rod just about every time. And by the end of it, I'd be proud to pull up that trailer and show just about every one of you in this room. And I think they're decent welds and I trust them to go down the road every day. Furthermore, I ran into issues with the planning because I didn't even know where to start. And I found very quickly that that's a rather easy part of it and that I shouldn't have really been too scared of it. As you can see here, this is my trailer. After it had all been completed, lights are all hooked up and everything. And what this has taught me is it has taught me to encourage everybody else, like every single person in this room, when you see that check engine light in your vehicle, you might ought to try and do it yourself because it could be something simple and save you a lot of time and money. Thank you. Can we ask questions? Sure, go ahead. Anybody have any questions at all? How difficult was that to get uh, license on after you built it? It was not difficult at all. Okay. All you have to do is you drive down to uh, Troop G, just outside of town, and they'll look it over, they'll check your welds over, they'll make sure that it's a proper width for street legality, and they'll make sure you made it yourself and did not steal it. <laughs> so, as long as you don't plan on that, I think you'll be okay. <laughs> you did the wiring yourself? Too? Yes, I did. How frequently do you use this trailer? I have used it every Saturday and Sunday so far. These guys will be happy to answer your questions too if you have any questions for them.
I want to know about the code breakers. Do really only cost forty dollars? Can any, you buy that at O'Reilly's or where? I bought one at uh, Walmart. It cost me forty dollars. Plugs into the OBD two under the dash. Really? Hmm. I think they've got one at O'Reilly's that costs you sixty, but I went to Walmart. Well, what could you tell? Overall, what do you feel about the senior project, the the work that you put in, the uh, you know your planning and everything that you did? Is it, it once you got the product finished? Uh, do you think it was a uh, well worthwhile educational experience for you? Yes, sir. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, if we didn't already have a 16 foot trailer, I would probably tackle one of those. Uh, I have used this thing absolutely as often as I think I could get a use out of it between work and school. I take lawnmowers to my grandmother's, I take four wheelers back and forth from my house and my friends, we work on them, and then we haul a gator back and forth and a welding trailer back and forth. And I've used this thing so often and it has already been worth its weight in gold. So do you do a lot of public speaking? No sir. Okay, that's <laughs> interesting. Because I had an opportunity of watching all five of them, the top fives. And you wouldn't know that y'all didn't do any public speaking because y'all you're really, really good. I mean you're smooth and you're you're relaxed and you communicate well and so yeah, I just I'm pretty impressed with y'all. That's good stuff. So, and you guys might on the other top, I guess th uh, three of the other five Tell us kind of what your topic was. Go ahead, Barney. Go ahead. Um, my topic was based around how music can affect a person's mind beneficially, whether it is expanding a person's view on cultures of the world, uh, being able to control a person's emotion, and being able to in influence a person's mind intellectually as well. And then that was my research, and it tied all into me restoring one of the sousaphones that Mr. John East had purchased while he was the band director here. I knew Mr. John East, I didn't know him personally, but I knew he had a major impact on a lot of people, not just within the school, but also within the community. And I knew he inspired so many people. And me playing the tuba myself, seeing that instrument hanging on the band room walls for so long, it made me feel upset for the instrument. And so I took it upon myself with my mentor, Mr. Good, to restore that bit of Willow Springs history and try and bring it back to its former glory. Um, I made a educational short film for the first responders around the area in the case of a school shooting. Adam Webb was a part of that. Um, uh, my research was about um, the benefits of film and how it can be used as an educational tool within the school and how it should be used in almost every single classroom. And so by researching that, I just kind of like moved my passion from movies and film into an actual tool that the first responders can use um, as a visual aid to um, help in preparation for the event. Uh, for my research, I looked into the benefits that students receive from playing sports, uh, physical education, such. And then for my project, I broadcasted a middle school football, basketball, and a high, high school girls basketball game. And then I believe Taylor Reese uh, was kind of spiritual, devotional, and she actually published a book. She published a devotional, um, I think it was how many days, do you guys remember? Uh, I think it's like, uh, I thought it was a hundred. Uh, there, 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 was, there was a hundred. There's a fifty different people, and then she did one based on every question that she asked them. So. It's like a hundred days devotional for yeah. targeted to young girls for self-esteem and right. just um, and it, it, it definitely had a, a spiritual aspect to it yeah. as well. And you can actually nice and you can actually purchase that book. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like eight yeah. bucks. Still can. Where at? Uh, <laughs> you'd have to get in contact with her um, or Mrs. Wilson or yeah. just call the high school. And, Okay. Yeah. And I know that the cost of the book completely evens out to what it took to make the book yeah. and what it takes to ship. So she gets, it's just a complete non-profit. Yeah, yeah. non-profit kind of thing. So, and then overall, I mean, what was interesting to me is that how much money did y'all spend on your project? Zero. Zero dollars. My most expensive thing was buying paint, uh, <laughs> spray paint down at Wagner's, but yeah. that just cost like 20 bucks. <laughs> They probably would have donated it to you. Yeah. <laughs> and ben, ben probably has quite a bit more, but you also have something to show for it, too. Yes, sir. Because you can't buy a trailer for that, that cheap at all. No, sir. Because that's the cost of consumerism. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I think Taylor, actually, I think Taylor basically broke, broke even. even. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so I, mean, I thought it was interesting that Dr. Spence told all the juniors when he presented them that, you know, it doesn't have to cost a lot no. of money. You, know, you can do it and do a good job and, and, and still you know protect the pocketbook. I put this information together. I, I gave a copy to Dr. Spence and shared it with each of the board members. I just wanted to go through and just see where most of the projects were falling. 
Um, and when I did that, I mean, I, I had 9.5 and 2.5 because I split bins in half. Because I figure, I figure half of yours was arching crafts and half of yours was school security. So, yeah. so I kind of <laughs> broke it in half. But um, nine and a half were arching crafts, nine were education and learning, nine were that topic should be firearms, hunting, fishing, and survivalism, survivalist. Nine of those. Uh, six music, five personal health, five sports, and it kind of goes on down from there. So I thought it was kind of interesting. I just tried to fit him into a category, so I thought, thought that might give the board an indication of where um, most of the students' interests are falling. So, so you can just have that for your own, your own use. Very good. Right. Thank you all for coming Thank in tonight. Guys. Appreciate um, it. You're more than welcome to stay for the whole meeting, but you're more than welcome to head home. Ben's got to get back to work. <laughs> oh, it's good that the Little Springs paper put it. Yeah. The whole section there of pictures of all of them around now. They did a good job. Just go through. That's interesting to know, too, the, the price of these. I'm, you know, that's uh, something that's been a complaining point for some in the past and it, they don't have to cost that much. Exactly right. It's all in what you choose to do and how you choose to pursue it. That's right. <coughs> Very good. Um, moving on then, we've got a, a, an agenda in front of us. Are there any changes to the agenda tonight? No changes. No changes. Uh, consent agenda in front of you. Uh, are there any questions over the consent agenda? I have one. I can find it. Well, it wasn't a big one. It's on chips. Yes. Um, it's pretty small, insignificant, but then again, it's, to me, it's not. We got an April bank fee for 50 cents from Simmons Bank. What, why are they charging us? Because we get that every month because when I pay my state taxes, there's a fee. Gotcha. And it's like every I've month. Never, I've never seen that before. And it's like yes. every month they charge me. There's no way around it. Yeah. Run twelve million dollars right every year, and they got to charge us a fee. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 That's my gripe. Right. <laughs> it's like they're not making anything on our right. twelve million dollars. Right. So, anyhow, <laughs> any other questions on the consent agenda items? Not. I would receive a motion to approve as presented. So moved by Adam. A second. My colleague, any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 And opposed? Very good. Um, administrative reports, Marty. All right, well, I'm very proud of those guys, and, and that, was, that was five of the 78 that we had, and um, all the senior projects were beneficial, and everybody learned something, and um, I'm glad that most of you were there that night to, to watch those and, and see the value of our senior projects. Uh, the numbers on the report are, are pretty steady, um, so we'll get right to the of note items, and all the items in the of note category happened pretty much within the last two weeks, so it's been an extremely busy two weeks in the high school. Prom was 15 days ago. Um, great fun. Thanks to Mrs. Cochran and Ms. Barry for planning that. I uh, went to Big Cedar Lodge, an incredible pizza, and had a full night, and some of us, I think, are still recovering from, from prom. Senior projects, again, you saw the top five. Um, every student created a capstone project for their educational career, and that's really the way we look at it, is that is the capstone project of your potentially 13 years here at Willow Springs, and, and you finish off that senior project. And uh, That's a proud moment for our students, and um, I regret that we didn't get to have that for last year's group, but it was very... Uh, inspiring to see it back this year. Alpha Rota, um, that's the regional art show that our high school students participate in. Willow Springs was fourth out of nine schools at Alpha Rota. Lots of awards, lots of ribbons, and our sophomore, Mackenzie Smith, was second overall student out of those nine schools. So she's an extremely talented, talented artist. And Mrs. Schultz does a nice job with our art program. Band and choir both had concerts on May 2nd, on a Sunday. Outstanding performances by both, and a big thank you to Mr. Cochran and Mr. Haji for coordinating that. Nice to have live concerts again. Um, band concert was in the gym, and then the choir concert was at First Baptist Church this year, and the acoustics there were really, really good, and it, uh, it really added a kind of an extra level to our choir concert. Uh, the FFA had their banquet on Saturday. Uh, their had a lot of awards given out. Their ag mechanics team, Ben Ivins, was actually a part of that team, was sixth in the state. 
So that's quite the uh, accomplishment for our Ag Mechanics team. Senior trip, went to Branson, did go-karts, zip line, landing, movies. We were all over Branson. And for those of us who were still having trouble recovering from prom, that was another <laughs> lengthy night, but uh, the kids had a really good time. And um, Mrs. Wilson planned that out and everything. Both, all of the end of the year, I just can't say how smooth all that's been. You know, you, usually you're going to have some little thing pop up, but um, everything has been extremely smooth. Graduation, appreciate you guys attending, and um, from my vantage point, I think that went fairly smoothly. And, um, again, a really well-attended event and um, a nice moment for our graduates. And then sports, we're kind of starting to wrap up our spring sports season. Track, uh, they had their SCA meet. Girls were second in the SCA, the boys were third. And they've got their district meet on Saturday at Owensville. So they're going to travel a ways for their district meet. Baseball is playing better. They've been in some tight games. Um, they've got districts coming up next week. Golf's having another great season. Districts this week and then state next week. And then tennis um, had some of our tennis players here tonight. They were the SCA champs as a team. Ben Clarkson was the singles champ. Cody Ward and Thomas Chaney were the doubles champs. Justin Chaney and Martin Leia were doubles runner-up. And then Ben and Cody won district doubles and will play a team from New Covenant in the state sectionals later this week. So doing very well. And also as a team, they're the number one seed in their district tournament. They played their first round tonight, won that. So they'll play for the team championship in their district tomorrow. And that's here in Willow as the number one seed they get to host. And then coming up, we have transition day tomorrow. That'll be district-wide, so I'm sure the other two principals will say something about that as well. But that is a first-time endeavor for all of us. We're going to attempt to move all of the students up one grade for one day and then move them all back the next. So. Um, oh, nobody said anything about moving anybody back. <laughs> oh, they're going back. They're going back. Um, our, our teachers are, are nervous but excited about that, and we're, we're just going to embrace a little controlled chaos tomorrow and try to give everybody a taste of what their schedule is going to be like next year. So I think it's going to be beneficial for everybody. Um, our sen senior banquet will be Thursday. We started that two years ago. It took the place of the academic awards. We do more of a banquet now just for seniors and their parents, and we do the scholarships and all the major awards that come with being seniors and we feed the parents. And that's gonna be at the gym on Thursday. It was really great two years ago. So we're gonna do that again. And then it uh, will be time for summer school. When is summer school? June. In June. Yep. Right after Memorial Day. Any other questions for Marty? Just one. Uh, on your uh, ADA report. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at the total for average daily attendance down there, 369.05. Where are you at? Uh, on the total line of your high school ADA 2019-2020. Okay. 369.05. Yep. Yeah, it's down toward the bottom, right under total ADA, and then you go to the very bottom of total ADA. You got 369.05. Okay. Okay. So I'm just. <laughs> Curious how you get to 369. I don't have that report in front yeah. of me. Well, that's sorry. I'm yeah, that's the one that's 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 that would that's include a summer school. Would that include a summer school number? No, I think we have we've had this conversation before. And I again I think it's kids in, kids out, mobility. I think that's a lot to do with it. I know on the surface of it it seems strange because it's Thirty points higher, higher than, than any other. other one. Yeah, I know. I get it. <laughs> but I know there's a formula. No, I, I, I know there's a formula in there. Yeah. Here, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I, I believe, and I, I think we have talked about. I'm not before. picking on you. I'm just no, trying I to understand. See, it shows three sixty nine of five for your total. So mm -hmm. I just don't see. Yeah, how, how, we get, how did it jump up? I just don't yeah, let, to let me look we into can that. Find that out. What happens on yeah, that, I'm just, Dean? I'm just curious. Yeah. Dean, what happens on that is the secretary to take care of all the ADA, and they just forward it on to yeah. Mandy. So it, it is what it is. Yeah. But I'm a, I'd like to take a look at it. Just what I'd like to do is put my cell on that, put my mouse on that cell, click it, and see what the formula says. Because I think there's, there's got to be a reason why it's doing that, but I can find out. All right. We've had that question one time. We did. We've had a conversation. I, uh, I'm blank on what the answer was. I don't there remember. Was an I think Dean Ashley, don't you remember the answer? Probably Dean. I think it was Dean. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Dean. That, that question's been asked and answered several times. So. 
<laughs> we will research it. One day I'll remember. <laughs> we don't remember the answer yet or so. I remember we talked. By golly, I'm gonna find out. I'll, I'll get it to you. So I just thought there was a number somewhere because I couldn't find it. Anymore. Yeah, I was feeling really stupid. So. <laughs> it's a good number. I like it. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Marty? Thank you. Yeah. Tina. Okay. Um, my numbers are significantly different unless you look at that 100% attendance number. Um, we had a stomach bug go through in April, and it. Um, Hmm. Impacted attendance. It was somewhere between a one and three day bug for most of them. So um, our 100% our attendance went to the double digits from being in the triple digits all year. Um, but we did stay high. But it helped your 95% attendance. Our over 95% attendance looks good. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah all those. <laughs> they, they missed a day or two in there, but they, uh, they came back quickly. So. Um, we have a lot of field trips going on. This week is a busy week. Fifth grade took their field trip last week. All three other grades are going this week. We also have our social on Thursday night. Um, and of course, tomorrow is transition day, as uh, Dr. Spence mentioned, and we're very excited about that. That's um, getting the new fourth graders over to our building is just, they're, they're very excited. And our eighth graders, I think, are excited about going to the high school. They, they say they're nervous, but they're, I, I can see the excitement in them. So, um, so lots going on this week, um, busy week. We have map tested. We spent two weeks map testing. Seventh grade went first, and I cannot even tell you what a difference having um, enough computers for that whole building to test at once has made. We could test, we could have tested all four grades at once. What we did was we started with seventh grade and they were kind of our guinea pigs. We did have a little weak spot in our Wi-Fi that we got, Andrew and Vasily got worked out very quickly that we didn't find when we did our, our Wi-Fi stress test. And the second week we tested three grades all at once and it was just as smooth as could be. Um, it is a lot of work. We're the only building that every single grade level takes at least two tests and two of the grades take three tests. So we get 10 map tests in our building. And that's a lot. Mrs. Henry just goes like a whirlwind that whole time because she's the one who takes care of all of the, um, the testing, making sure everything, everybody has what they need. But it went, it went well. Um, we're looking forward to getting those results back. And um, the students really worked hard and seemed to take it very seriously and was just really proud of them. Um, Let's see, iReady. I, I included the iReady reports from our building and I gave you a year-long view of that. Um, we're reading in math, and I'll just go through them rather briefly. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them, or if you have follow-up questions, you can email me or give me a call, and I'm always happy to go into more detail. That top page is a, it's a five-level breakdown of the building, and of course we want that top part, that green part, to get longer throughout the year, and we want that red part to get shorter throughout the year. Um, and it did, basically. I'm not unhappy with the progress that we made at the top end. I am unhappy with the progress we're not making at the bottom end, because to end the year with 29% of our students reading two or more grade levels below their grade level, um, I don't look at that as a success. So we are continuing to have that conversation and work on that and say, what can we do? Um, our RTI teachers are, are working hard on that, and what can we do to try to get those in the red zone. That's the, those are the hardest students, it seems like, to move up. It's fairly easy to move somebody in the yellow zone who's only one year behind up into that green zone. But when you're dealing with a student who's in seventh grade and who's maybe reading at a second or third grade level, that's pretty tough. And they make progress, but even if they make progress, there's still a lot of times two or more grade levels behind. So they're still down there in the red. Um, I broke that down by grade level for you. And every grade level made some pretty good progress as far as um, growing their green line and shrinking their red line. Eighth grade had a little bit of a setback on that last test. Um, we did end the year in reading, though, with 62% of our eighth graders reading at or above grade level. So we're very happy with that. Um, I don't know, we don't have a good explanation as to why that red line grew, though. Um, so we're kind of we're looking at that, and, and our yellow line shrank, too. So that means more students were reading behind by that third test. Um, math, we made some good progress. If you look at that, that top report, we really shrank that red zone, and we were, we were happy with that, um, and our green zone grew considerably. And then I broke that one down um, by grade level for you, too. 
and particularly um, our sixth graders made some really huge progress. They doubled the number of students, or the percent of students, I guess they number, the percent of students who were at or above grade level by the end of their year. Um, seventh grade did the same. Uh, fifth grade, they, they all made really good progress. Um, so, but we are still working on that bottom end. We're looking at different ways we can shrink that range <coughs> further. We are adding some math elective classes next year that are designed to try to just make math a little bit more fun and build on some, some math skills, basic math skills with some fun activities that maybe they're not feeling like they're painfully learning math. It's um, a lot of computer-based things. We're, we're going to try a couple of different computer-based programs. Um, we have three classes. Every class of eighth grade has an elective math class next year um, <clears throat> that will be part of their electives, and we're hoping to, to make some progress there. And we'll keep looking at our data to see if that's going to be beneficial or not. Um, and then we have some trainings coming up this summer. I was, I'm always happy to see my teachers willing to sacrifice those days in the summer to go to some um, professional development. We have one called Conscious Discipline that is, if you haven't done in your school district, it's a really expensive training. Um, but we had the opportunity to send it for just a, send people for just a per person fee. So we have, gosh, almost 10 people, I think, um, going to that in July for a couple of days, and it's a discipline model. And teaching teaches teachers how to not let students push their buttons and to, to help students who are, why are they trying to push your buttons? So it's, a, it's an interesting model. And then we have the Go CSD Innovation Summit the first week of August, and we have a lot of teachers district-wide going to that. I was really happy to see how many signed up for that. Um, and that's a big conference where we get to see a lot of national speakers, and it costs us 20 bucks a person to go. Um, so it's, it's always really good. Questions? No question, just a comment. I like the looks of this iReady report. It's something that us dummies can read really easy and see what kind of progress you're making. Other than just a, than just a here's where we are, this lets us know where we are and where we've been. Appreciate well, and, that. You know, trans, tra trying to be transparent, I'm not, you know, we're, we're trying different things to make some progress. Um, like I said, I'm not happy with that red bar. I'd like to see that red bar disappear completely, but um, we're, we're working toward that. I think these are easier to read than the, than the pyra uh, pyramid, right? Yeah. Definitely. They're a lot better. It's just a, it's a yeah, different type of Just a different report, I get. Do you, do you think any of the, the shutdown and everything, is this, is this a factor from that last year, or is this pretty standard through, I mean, is this, is this something you see every year where you're battling this, like, kind of feeling like behind or whatever, or are we behind because of, of the shutdown and the way school's been the last year? Well, um, I won't say that our reports look significantly different this year. Um, than they do than they did last year. You don't think they do? I don't think that they do. We always, you know, we're always fighting that bottom end. Um, I did, at the beginning of the year, I ran our first iReady, our first two iReady reports against last year's iReady reports because we only had two last year. And our reading scores were not significantly different from our first report looked a lot like our first report last year. Our math scores were. I feel like if we're going to be fighting um, ground we lost is going to be in math more than reading. So um, we're just going to continue to fight that battle though and try new things. I wish there were an answer out there where somebody said, oh, well, we did this and it works and it works every time. But, you know, I, I ask questions and I listen when we go to conferences and I'm not hearing any one thing that is really making huge progress for anybody. It's We're all just trying to figure out how we can get better at it. So. I'm just going to, with the ESSER 3 money that's coming up and the amount that has to be spent on bridging that gap, if we're not seeing significant significant gaps between, you know, where does that money then focus has, on? Well, it still has to be utilized for running the loss. So right. for us, it's like $700,000. So I've had some preliminary conversations with the administrator about what that looks like. Uh, you, can, you can put that in the staff. You can put that in there. You can add more certified teachers. And you can do class size reduction. The problem with doing that is that when those dollars go away, you still have to sustain those positions. So you don't really right. want to add more people. You don't have to. I think it's going to be probably probably more in programs. Uh, we could look at starting an after school program, possibly uh, more to more tutoring for kids after school. I think would be a good thing. Uh, curriculum purchasing curriculum material materials. I think um, I just had the ESSER two budget approved today. 
and you'll be seeing, we've already purchased the, uh, the five through six uh, English language arts curriculum. We're adding seventh and eighth grade to that, as well as a five through eight social studies series that will be purchased with SR2 money. And so anytime that you can do that and you have an assessment piece in it, then you can justify that it's helping to resolve learning loss. But we're still kind of talking about what we can do. I mean, $700,000 to spend in a year and a half on learning loss is a pretty big deal. Right? Oh, no. Eighth grade math. Um, is it pre algebra, algebra? What do the eighth graders um, take? Eighth graders take either regular eighth grade math or algebra one. And that does not break out on iReady. They all take the same iReady test. Um, what we will see the difference in that will be the, our eighth graders take either just the eighth grade math, math test or the algebra one EOC. So when we get those scores back, we'll see how those break down, which will probably be August. Any other questions? Thank you. Bobby? Yeah, upcoming events. Uh, Dr. Spence mentioned uh, summer school. Just a little update. It's June 1st through June 24th. Um, I'm not sure how widely known it is, but Chris Rogers will be the summer school director uh, this summer for K-4. Uh, Dr. Spencer will be 5-8. Um, K-4, through as of today, we had about 200 enrollees. Uh, typically, that's up around 250 to 270. Uh, we will get several this week during our kindergarten screening, which will bump that up. And uh, I assume it'll be pretty close to a typical enrollment for summer school, but it's all planned and ready to go. Um, I concur with Dr. Spence. The last few weeks has just run smoothly to have skipped a year of the fourth quarter and end of the year stuff. Uh, it seems like it's just like riding a bike, knock on wood. I hope it doesn't uh, blow up tomorrow. But uh, some of the things we're celebrating is map testing. Uh, we tested for three days uh, and it really went flawless. And that's a credit to Erin Brower, our building testing coordinator. And uh, she had good support from uh, Chris Wagner and of course the tech guys, uh, Andrew and Miss Silly and then the teachers implementing uh, everything just did a fantastic job. Uh, we celebrated our teachers last week with all kinds of goodies and food and uh, I've never heard anyone say, well, they just appreciated me too much, you know? <laughs> uh, and so really, anytime we can do something to show how much we appreciate our teachers, uh, you know, we should be doing it. Uh, today, kindergarten graduation, probably not quite the event uh, that high school was Friday night, but it was very well attended and felt good to have uh, stakeholders, parents, uh, grandparents uh, in our building uh, live and in person, uh, and it went really very well. We uh, promoted over 100 kindergartners, just a little over 100 uh, this morning, and it went uh, pretty smoothly, I think. And uh, I have uh, some iReady data included in your report. Uh, it's not the same report as uh, Dr. Spencer's, but uh, the pyramid is a building comparison. So every student in elementary that took the iReady, uh, I did the first and third diagnostic tests with that, and then I compared the second and third in both math and reading. And uh, we had significant gains uh, in each of those areas. Um, obviously, uh, there's still work to be done. Uh, personally, my goal is 80%, and that may be uh, a little too far, unrealistic, but uh, as a principal, as a teacher, and when I was in my classroom, 80% seemed like a good target to be on grade level. Uh, and we continue to work to improve that. I also, and a couple of you who have students in my building, probably received a parent report. Uh, I put a couple of examples of that in there as well, just so you would know what parents get. Um, we sent it home after the last diagnostic test this year, and it just compares uh, each of the three uh, tests that the student takes and how they've grown throughout the year. And uh, 
over to the right, it will, uh, in each of the domains, it tells uh, if they're on grade level, approaching grade level, or needs improvement. So, and if you like the other report, I will get with Dr. Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> For a small fee, I would do that. I didn't see any. Uh, button on there for reports for dummies. Though, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions for Bobby? Do the teachers or somebody provide uh, help to parents to understand how to read those um, reports? You know, we did not this year. Uh, we did um, last year. I didn't get the year straight, but at parent-teacher conferences, we did yeah. uh, provide that. Now, you know, if you understand educational jargon and stuff, they're not too bad. But, yeah. You know, somebody just... I think that report, uh, it says four families, and yeah. it's supposed to be kind of self explanatory yeah. maybe put it in there. It's not bad. terminology yeah but I can see I know the percentile and yeah you know national percentile and all that it's probably uh, something that could use an explanation put things in perspective yeah. anything else thanks Bobby Marlena I don't have a lot this month just because I'm <coughs> finale of the year to report to you on numbers. Um, I know there were some questions asked at the last board meeting and the board meeting before about uh, the percentage of students we've placed off of initial referral for special ed. Uh, we're still in process. I have 13 that we're wrapping up this week evaluations. So the next board meeting I'd like to give you a little data on how many initial referrals and how many of those were placed and where we are numbers wise. Uh, things we have been working on. Um, I've been working with Dylan and Officer Moore on some mental health side of things to put in place for next school year. Um, and then a change for next year for us. I think that uh, due to COVID and um, I think Desi sometimes just likes to change things to keep us on our toes, but they are going to be um, requiring a lot more um, data on the special ed side of things on progress monitoring. So that'll be a training for our special ed staff next year. Um, anybody that's worked with IEPs or students um, know that there's a progress report that parents uh, receive monthly that uh, reports how the student is doing on their IEP goals. Um, typically that's marked as making progress, not making progress, or goal not addressed. Um, so they want us to be a little more uh, picky on the data that's going to be put in those reports that are sent to parents as well. Um, they actually want um, something other than clicking the button, <laughs> I guess I should say. So we're going to be looking at some training on um, collecting data, using that data to measure um, student progress, what's attainable, what's not attainable. I know a lot of times what special ed teachers um, in the past, what they've done on IEP goal writing is um, look at a goal and say that a student's um, baseline one year was a 40% and the next year um, you were hoping to achieve the goal at a 75 or 80 percent and then the next year instead of maybe looking at a different skill gap they just upped the um, percentage that they want the student to increase and I think after um, compliance has been looking at that they're saying if a student can increase 35 percent in one year then the next year a student should be able to increase 35 percent and not just the 10 or 15 percent um, that's kind of been a habit of teachers doing so we're going to be looking at some things to change that and making things a little more measurable and data collection on the IEP side of things for next year for us, so. Any questions? I'm assuming you've probably got a few openings for paraprofessionals in your I do, I need six, if you know, anybody, <laughs> um, six professionals. Most of the R's that have resigned have taken um, jobs closer to where they live just because parapay is not fabulous. So um, I know we've lost some to their hometowns I'm also needing a seventh grade special ed teacher still. So. Thank you. And just real quick, just to add, just to remind to the board that we have our staff appreciation day uh, on Friday. It's this Friday, May 14th. Uh, Adam's volunteer to he's going to pull out the grill and, and grill some burgers, and, and uh, Max is going to help too. And 
But I think it, I think it'd be great. Everybody come out, and we'll start serving at ten thirty, and folks will be encouraged to come out and get a burger. And I think we actually, I think there's a rumor about some cornhole boards maybe being set up, and 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 it, it promises to be a fun time. But it's it's an opportunity to come out and and just uh, thank the staff that, and let them know that you appreciate everything that they do and everything that they've done. It's been a difficult year, and and I, I think it's a good way to let them know that uh, you care about what they're doing and it's important to you. I assume an email's been sent out to all the staff. It's already been sent out about a week or so ago. So, and I'll probably send out another reminder on Thursday. Just let them know. So, okay, all right, very good. So you didn't mean just show up at ten thirty when we start serving. That's what I saw the email. Yeah, I want to make sure that. Uh, yeah, you might want to come a little bit so earlier than that. Somebody at the end of the table down there understands that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you would think the retirees would show up yeah. there early and get this, get this working for us. Who's there whatever time you guys request my presence, you just let me know. Well, well, I think Adam said something like 9 o'clock or no, something. No, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. I'll be there. Polar spot before us, you know. Just a little gesture right there. All right, very good. Um, we'll move on. We've got our proposed cell phone policy for the middle school. Yes, and, and I've shared that with the board. I think Dr. Spencer wants to speak to that this evening. And, uh, I have to that down to Mandy. I had to borrow her copy. I don't want to lose it. Um, so I just wanted to get some input on this. Um, this is kind of a big change, and generally when we get input on big changes, it comes to you before it comes to me. I get very few um, complaints or phone calls on building policies. Most of what we deal with is unhappiness that my student is, has consequences. We're violating a building policy, but our policies, we, we look at them every year. We look at what's working, what's not working. Do we even need a policy for that? And if it's, if it's something that is, isn't an issue, then, then why would we? Um, we look to try to stay in alignment with the high school. We go through their policy book every year, and we try to keep our discipline in alignment with theirs. Same categories. Um, maybe take it down a little bit of a notch because our students are still learning and don't have a lot of life experiences yet. So we're trying to teach them in a safe environment that it's okay to make a mistake once in a while, but that some, some of those mistakes can have consequences to them. We also try to keep our policies workplace oriented. And cell phone policies are one of the things that if you're a business owner, a lot of businesses are dealing with. I worked in private business for about seven years before I came here. And that was one of the main things that you dealt with with employees was wasted time and workplace accidents that can happen whenever they have their face in their cell phone all day. So what we want to try to teach in our building is responsible cell phone use. And right now we're, we're not getting there. Um, we're not actually looking at changing the policy. Our policy right now reads that when you get on school grounds in the morning, your cell phone needs to go away, hopefully in your bag, and you don't really even need one. But it goes in your bag, and we don't see it, we don't hear it, you don't use it during the school day. We're not trying to do that to, you know, be like a prison or anything. It's just that we have students in our building who are in a very different developmental <coughs> stage than the ones at the high school. And many of them are carrying cell phones for the first time. And they don't have those experiences to know how to, to use them and use them um, and think about the consequences of some of the things that they're doing with them. They also think, and I heard one tell me today, oh, I'm a multitasker. Because he was doing something, and I said, oh, I need you to stop doing that and listen to me. I'm a multitasker. Well, multitasking is a myth. Um, I see several cell phones out on the table, and if that cell phone goes off, lights up, you're going to look at that, and if you read that text, you're going to stop listening to what I'm saying, because your brain cannot focus on two things at once, and no, it has not evolved since the invention of cell phones. <laughs> brain research tells us, and that's why we're not allowed to text and drive. How many of you have ever been going down the road, guilty right here, think, I'll just glance at that, oop, I'll just give a close a quick answer and then the next thing you know oops I'm almost in the ditch and, and you had a little bit of a scare there and that's why we don't text and drive is because your brain cannot fully focus on two things at once and our problem is and it's not a small problem it's because I wouldn't be even looking at this if it were three or four kids it's a systemic problem of students coming into the building and they're very worried about their cell phones and about the things that are happening on their cell phones during the day um, you know, like I said, we have students in a very different developmental stage. I have 10-year-old 
fifth graders coming into my building and we're exiting 14 year old um, eighth graders that are going off to the high school so very they look very different from one grade to the next we did a little bit of a poll to see who had how many people we were dealing with in each grade so of our fifth graders 55 percent of our 10 and 11 year old fifth graders carry cell phones to school pretty much every day 54 percent of our sixth graders so about the same a little bit lower seventh grade goes up to 69 percent and 84% of our 8th graders, so more than 8 out of every 10 8th graders, carry cell phones to school on a daily basis. In our building, we have a building total of 66%, so 2 out of every 3 of our students come to school almost every day with a cell phone. And here's what we're doing. I have a 10-year-old. He's coming over to the 5th grade next year. We're all very excited about that. But here's what we do. I, as a parent, I hand my 10-year-old a cell phone, and I say, okay, now that's expensive, and they do cost several hundred dollars. Don't lose it and don't break it. So I can walk down the halls of my school and I can say, where's your math book? I don't know. Where's your social studies assignment? No idea. Where's your pencil? I don't know. Where's your cell phone? They can all tell you that. Because that's one problem we don't have. We don't lose cell phones. Uh, people don't steal them because they know you can track them. And they always know where that cell phone is because usually it's in their pocket or some of them tuck it down right in the front of their pants or in their hoodie pocket. But most of the time it's, they're wearing it on them somewhere. Um, it causes a variety of issues, we, and I've listed some of those, um, and we've looked at different ways to deal with this. I'm a member of the SCA Middle School Principals Group, and we email each other all the time about, okay, so this is an issue we're having in our building, can you send me your, your policies on this, what's your discipline code for this, um, how, do, how are you dealing with this, and the two issues that have come up the most in the two years I've been doing this are cell phones, what are you doing about them? and all the problems that come with them, and vaping. Right now, those are the, the two big issues. And in March, I went to the state secondary principals meeting, and there was a middle school round table, and all of the middle school principals from around the state came, and we just discussed topics, two main topics of discussion. What are you doing about cell phones? What are you doing about vaping? Those are the two issues that we're dealing with in this age group right now. Um, one person had an answer for that. She's the assistant principal of the year for the state of Missouri, and they had tried this in their school, and it was something that they immediately had some good consequences, or some, some good, yeah, consequences from. Um, so it's not just, students don't just sit in class and whip out their cell phone and start talking to someone. That's not the issue we're having, although I've, I've caught some talking to, some, to, to different people, but a lot of they know we don't have cameras in the bathrooms. We can see them anywhere they are in our building, pretty much. Classrooms, the teachers are monitoring, um, hallways. But we have a lot of unnecessary trips to the bathroom. And it's a lot in our 7th and 8th grade. I would say that probably well over half of our 7th and 8th grade restroom traffic is for cell phone use. Girls and boys, but more so noticeable in the girls, probably. Um, it's... The, that four minutes they have between classes, they slip in there, they send a quick text, and then they get to class, and then somebody texts them back. Bzz, my cell phone just buzzed. So I want to know who it is, and then I may need to answer that. So can I use the restroom? And I have, I have so much hall traffic just from that bathroom back and forth. And we don't tell them they can't use the bathroom. We may tell them you need to wait a minute, or no, you've already been twice this hour, can't you hold it till the bell? But for the most part, if they say they need to use the restroom, we let them go. And for the most part, when they're in the restroom, I think we're, we're having more cell phone issues in there than we probably even know about. Um, other issues that come up, we have a, a lot of, a um, couple of weeks ago, I had a parent show up at my door. Um, we had a problem between, a student had had a problem with an, a teacher. And before that student or that teacher could report that problem to anybody in the building, I had a parent standing at my door, door telling me about that problem that had just happened less than 30 minutes before. Um, instead of telling us there is a problem, Mrs. Cotton, Gim, and I are the two people who can fix problems. If you're having a problem with another student, if you're having a problem with a teacher, if whatever the problem is, we can probably help with that, but we need to hear about it from the student. And that is one of the things that we're trying to teach them is advocate for yourself. When you have a problem, when I have a problem, my mom doesn't call Mr. Hall and tell, tell him that. Um, as we grow into adulthood, we need to learn to take care of our own problems, and that's one of the things that we are trying to, to teach our students. Um, we have some trouble with, a little bit of trouble with cheating. Um, we've caught students in the classroom trying to um, look up test answers on their, on their phones. 
A lot of times you can get halfway through a test. You would never do that, would you? No. no. Then that's how. <laughs> you can get halfway through a test. Never no. And say, mm, need to use the restroom. Go to the restroom. Google an answer or two that you don't know, and then you go back. And gosh, you've just done better on your test. We have that problem. And these are not hypotheticals. These are things that we actually deal with. On the worst end of it, I'm 12 years old, and I have this cell phone. It takes pictures. It puts me in connection with anybody in the whole world. And my mom is not here to monitor that when I'm at school. I can, again, go in the bathroom, close the stall door, and nobody really knows what it is I'm doing on this phone in there. We've had um, to deal with Officer Moore on um, some of our students. Inappropriate relationships over social media with much older people. Um, I think it's funny if I'm 12 years old maybe to snap a picture in the locker room. I send that picture to a friend. I just distributed child pornography in the eyes of the law and they don't care how old I am. We've had to deal with that. Um, bathrooms. I have a lot of TikTok videos made in my, in my seventh and eighth grade bathrooms I hear. I've not seen any of them. I don't know how to TikTok, but I'm sure I, the students could teach me. But um, just, and it's daily. It's, it's not, like I said, this is not an isolated incident. I, I wouldn't even be worrying about it if it were. Um, just a lot of distraction because when you hand a student this, for some of them it's their first experience with a cell phone. And what we're trying to teach them is to be responsible with it. We've let our eighth grade start having them on Fridays at lunch, and, but we have rules that go with that. And that's our whole building. We try to give them rules that we don't want sheep, we don't want blind followers, but we want reasonable rules that you would find in, in any reasonable place. So don't take pictures of people without their permission. Don't post them on social media without their permission. Don't make rude remarks on social media if you do post the picture. Um, don't sit at a table and talk on the phone when you're in a social circle. Those kinds of things are the rules we have, just trying to teach them some cell phone etiquette and get them ready for high school. The number one question the eighth graders asked as I was talking to them about transition day was, are they going to let us use our cell phone? That was the first question out of their mouths. It is such a preoccupation. And it's not just them. I mean, we all have it a little bit. but. It is, it is something that, that we deal with regularly and we are looking for um, answers to that. So this lady um, who I sat in the, the uh, round table with had implemented a new policy in their building. And again, we're not looking at changing the policy. We're not going to change the fact that we're not going to let them have their cell phones throughout the day to the, to the extent that we can monitor that. But they had gotten locking cases, and they make them just for this specific pur purpose, because a lot of workplaces have this rule, too. If you go to Jasper, I've been to Jasper and toured the building, you're not allowed to have your cell phone at your workstation. It has to stay in your locker. And there's a reason for that, and it has to do with safety, and it has to do with um, they're paying you to work, not to be on your cell phone. So, again, just teaching them some workplace skills that they're going to have to deal with for the rest of their life. But... They make a box, it has a little shelf, they come in like 12 compartments or 16 compartments and they're not very big and they have a lock on them. And the students put their cell phones in there, they each have their own little shelf with their name on it. They stay there all day, the teacher locks it, and at the end of the day they get unlocked. And we would be looking at doing that during advisory, we're moving our advisory to the end of the day next year. So it'll be the last 20 minutes of the day, all students will be in an advisory class at the end of the day in the building. So before they go to class in the mornings, they would run by their advisory room, they would put their cell phone in that box, the teacher locks it, and it gets unlocked at the, at the end of the day, maybe five till three, and then they can, if they need to check a text message or whatever, then they could do that at that time. Um, they started implementing this in this building. She said she had no, um, no parent um, that was unhappy with this. And we get a lot of parents who, once you've had to come to school three or four times and your son or daughter is in ISS for three or four days by that point, um, over getting their cell phone taken away from them, we have parents who request, we want them to turn it in at the office every morning. And we have some who do that. They bring it by, they give it to Miss Stacy, she gives it back to them at the end of the day. But we can't do that with 300 cell phones. So we're just looking for solutions. Um, their, she said their trips to the bathroom immediately dropped, as did their tardies, because a lot of the problem is they go in there, um, they, they're using the restroom in between classes. We have four minutes. You do not have time to send a text message, stand there and wait for that text message to be returned, um, and then get to class on time. So we deal with a lot of tardies. Um, we also deal with some insubordination. 
<clears throat> you know, I saw you with your cell phone out, hand it over. Nope, not handing it over. So at that point it escalates and that becomes a little more serious offense. Um, just lots of tangential issues that go with the cell phones. I guess, um, you know, we have, our students have access to phones. They can come in our office, yes, we do make them tell us why they want to use the phone because what's an emergency to a sixth grader? Maybe something that we can solve. Today, it, it may have been, I forgot my field trip money. That's not an emergency that I need to call your mom at work, disturb her, um, have her call the school back thinking that something's wrong and have her leave work to come do that. That's something I can say, oh, you don't need to call her, bring it tomorrow, it'll be okay. Same way with um, a lot of things we deal with. We have the capacity at school to take care of the problem. Sometimes it is an emergency. I have a game tonight and I forgot my uniform. Absolutely, call your mom. Sometimes we just have upset kids. I had a lot of fifth and sixth graders with separation anxiety at the beginning of the year after being home for that long with mom and dad. And they just needed to talk to their mom. And they would come in my office and they'd cry for a minute and I'd say, let's call mom. And they would talk to her for a minute and feel better. So we don't keep them from using the phones. Um, and we do have access to the phones. And we also need some of those phone calls to come through our office. We have to know what bus that kid got on after school, if they changed buses, or who picked them up sometimes. And we spend a lot of time after school sometimes looking for kids anyway. Um, somebody shows up to pick somebody up, and somebody else got a, a cross wire or a message wrong, and um, you know, mom said, ride this bus, and dad thought he was supposed to pick them up. So we kind of need that communication to come through our office a lot of times. So anyway, we're looking for a solution. Um, I would, this is a solution I would, like to explore, and I wanted your input, several of you have kids in my building, um, what's your thought as parents and as the board members that the community is going to come to when, whenever, you know, they generally have an issue, they hit you up before they hit me up, so what are some concerns that you have? So we have the policy, it's already in place, don't, don't have cell phones out, don't use them, that's there. So we're looking for whether it gets these lock boxes or not. So here's my concern because I have, like I said, I have one coming into the building too. I want my son, as he goes through our building, to learn the responsibility of if you're in a place that has reasonable rules, that there is a reason for having them. It's interfering with our instruction. If you are not in class for 10 minutes of your math class because you're hanging out in the bathroom on your phone, you've just missed a good chunk of your instruction. I want my child to know that we have these rules for a reason, and I need to respect the rule. But what we're embedding in these little developing brains right now is, here's a rule, I'm going to do everything I can to figure out a way to sneak and get around it without getting caught. And that's what we're teaching them right now. It's not a respect for rules, it's um, a way to get around it. And this one is probably the one that we have the most trouble with, I would say. The, like I said, the other one is the vaping, but I think that's not as widespread because I don't have 66% of my building vaping right now. <laughs> I, I'm agreeing with you. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. Um, I guess we're just taking away some, uh, we're taking away that choice, and I don't want to take away all of their choices. Some of the coolest things in my building happen because they start getting choices. Come over tomorrow during fifth grade lunch and see those fourth graders coming over to the fifth grade First time in their lives, they have a whole cafeteria and they get to sit by anybody they want. And there's not a teacher sitting right there with them. And it is, it's the funniest thing to watch them. It's almost like they can't decide where to sit um, because they don't, want to, they don't want to mess this up the first time. And, you know, we want to give them those choices. Um, but some of those choices, they just aren't developmentally ready to handle yet. You know, if I'm 10 years old, I don't have experience with a cell phone yet. And I maybe don't need to have access to it all day long. So is this for all four grades? It would be because we don't really differentiate policy for okay, all so, four grades. So, yeah. I mean, because that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. So we're not really planning on teaching them skills on how to manage their time. We're just going to take it away from them and let Marty deal with them in the ninth grade, right? And a little bit, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I, I just want to make that, sure I understand. I say that honestly. Let me give you an example of, of the difference between the high school. I came from the high school, of course. And one of the first things that I was asked by one of my teachers when I went to the building was, can we chew gum in the building? Can we try to let the kids chew gum? And I looked at the handbook, and there had been a rule for years that nobody in the middle school could, could be caught with gum, and there were consequences for that. And I said, well, I don't see why not. I let my kids chew gum in my class, and they, they were responsible with Several it. Several weapons from Ms. Paxton. <laughs> so, so I said, sure, let's, have, yeah. let's we can do away with that rule, and, and let's make that not a rule anymore. And by December... I had gum all over my playground, 
on my sidewalks, going up my stairs, stuck to my floors. The bottoms of chairs and tables were just solid with it. One of my teachers said, I reached under to move the table and I stuck my hand in warm gum. That's not a good feeling. They were, it was literally, it was stuck to the walls, the little facing between the door and the walls. It was everywhere in my building and they had been worn several times. Come on guys, let's throw in the trash can when we're done with it. And for whatever reason, and it wasn't just one grade, for whatever reason, there's something about that developmental age that says, I think I'll stick my gum here instead of throwing it in the trash can. Okay, so let me ask you, I'm sorry, phone up. Upon entering the building, students report to the classroom which they have advisory. So I just want to see the mechanics of this. That's their first class of the day no, and their last the, class of the day? It's only their last class of the day, but we usually they usually have 10 to 15 minutes in the building before that first bell. They can use the restroom. It will be on the same floor. What time is the first bell? 8 o'clock. What time do we open the no, building? No, I'm sorry, 7.55. What time we open the building? Um, building is open at 7.30 for breakfast. I keep them on the playground. Before this year, I kept them out there to quarter till. The whole building's open at 7.30? The Grimes is open at 7.30. That's then, not where this classroom is going to be? No. So what time is the building open to? The building opens whenever I blow the whistle for them to go in. Which is? It, this year, we changed it to 7.50 because so they can't congregate in the hall. So they have from 7.50 to 7.55, .50 which is to first eight. bill. First bell. Eight, eight is tardy bell. So they have 10 minutes. So they have, so they ten, have they seven, seven minutes until 8 o'clock. They're not late until 8 o'clock. 10 They're minutes and they have to get to their advisory, lock up their phone, and then get back to their class. Yes. Okay. And, and got to get to their locker and the, get their stuff put away and get their stuff for the first hour. It's on the same floor. And it, most of them will be on the same floor. Good point. My eighth grade, my eighth graders go up to the eighth grade floor. Um, they put their stuff in their locker. Ten minutes is more than enough time. Our building's not that big, <laughs> and we're not that spread out. Everything for each grade level is mostly on that one floor. So. Okay, and so and you talk in here, if kids know they're going to leave early, how many kids leave early that you don't know about during a typical day? Um, I don't know because we don't usually ask them when they get. The, we don't ever ask them when they get there in the morning. Do you know if you're checking out? I, so I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I mean, would you guess? I mean, I can't even guess because some days we have a lot of kids check out early, and some days we have hardly any check out early. Thursday we will have almost none check out early because it's the social, and if you check out early, you don't qualify to sure. go to the social. Uh, okay, so I'm just trying to understand at how many times a day these classrooms are going to be interrupted by somebody who has to have their phone before they go home because they're checking out early. Right. And, we'll and, they didn't, and they didn't tell you or didn't know right. in the morning. We'll try to minimize that. And that could be a case where, um, you know, Stacy can tell me or Mrs. Cottingham and we can just run up and grab that kid's phone um, because the, the lock boxes, you know, we'll have keys to them. There's more than one. Well, there. yeah, but there's a classroom going on there, right? There is. There is. And, and hopefully that will get better as we all get more used to the rule and, and you know, Hopefully it won't it will be minimal I don't think it will be as great as the number of students who are right now missing instructional time because of cell phone distractions all right so when Marty put cell phone use in the high school I believe I said you were crazy right <coughs> what's you remember that when you first said cell phone use in the high school yeah yeah, I think I came to you and said, "Great." Oh, you probably did. You. How's that working? <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Again, different development. Uh, totally different. Don't get me wrong. Kids. We yeah. still have we have yeah. cell phone issues, no doubt. To totally different group of kids. But a lot of the things that you're saying are going on. While I don't doubt that they're going on, you're assuming they're going on because you really don't know what's going on in the bathroom. You don't know if those pictures are being taken in there. You don't know that that's where they're that that's what they're doing in there. I know a lot of it, but we don't. A lot of it we don't end up with consequences for at school because I have parent reports of saw this, you know, this kid has done this, sent it to my kid, things like that. But if it's not a, an issue at school, we don't consequence it at school if okay. we didn't catch them in the act. Okay. But, and the same thing with the cheating. I don't doubt that the cheating goes on. We catch a lot cheating of them always goes on. That, and I'm yeah. sure that that, uh, yeah. I'm sure that always go on in one way or another. And I, we did look at also, we looked at two other options. Um, one of them, I kind of took a poll of schools who upped their consequences, and there was one of them also at the round table, and they had just increased their consequences and made them really stiff for if you got caught using your cell phone in school, you, there was a really stiff penalty, and they said it really didn't make that much of a difference. It didn't decrease incidences that much. And we kind of know that from research. You know, you, um, it's the whole carrot and stick thing. It's not... It's not an effective way to manage 
issues. And I don't ever want to look at things in my building as what are we going to do to them when we catch them doing this. My first conversation is going to be how do we try to be proactive and keep them from making that poor choice in the first place. And I am open to other options. I don't want you to think that I think this is the be all and end all. This is the best that I've seen as far as somebody actually doing something that had a positive outcome. Um, we also, I talked to some schools that do let their middle schoolers use them between classes. I actually have a teacher in my building who came from um, a middle school that let them use them between classes and she said, you would not believe how much better it is in our building. And I went, better? But she said, because of just the issues that we fear, if you know we let them use them between classes, they shoot that text out and then all of a sudden they have to leave class because somebody answered them. So, um, you know, I don't think that letting them have more freedom, if I thought letting them have that extra freedom to use it would get it out of their system, then I absolutely would be for that because I think it kind of works at the high school, but they have longer between classes. And their students have had cell phones for longer than ours and they know that I don't really have to answer that right now. But when you're 10 years old and you just got that phone, man, that's a cool thing to have. And, and a lot of times it's the parents who are calling and texting. And it's, um, so they're kind of complicit. And I had a parent call last week and said, well, I sent my kid a text, but he hasn't called me back yet, so I'm telling you that I need him to ride this different bus. <laughs> okay, well, call us in the first place, <laughs> you know, because we need to know what bus they're going to be on anyway when they leave there. You know, so. one of the things, Dr. Spencer and the, and the board, is that as we kind of move up through grade levels, the way our, our systems have always been that designed is that you get more freedom as you go higher. Um, and, and typically it's worked. I mean, it's worked. High school kids, not always, but high school kids tend to know when they, about making more mature decisions. Uh, if the rule is don't, don't use it during, during class, just do it between classes, they're pretty good about it. I'm not saying that never happened. But when you give a middle school kid at different maturity level that same option, then they will more times than not abuse. All right, just because of the, the grade level the kids were talking about. And so it's not unusual to, to say, okay, we're going to solve the problem. We don't have this issue if we just make sure we just take it out of your hands. You know, they want to deal with it, and, and that way we're not going to be disruptive. There are some things that you point out, Dean, okay, what happens if you've got to go and get them? Well, I think we've got to work through that and figure that out. And what happens if they don't turn them in? Yeah, that's, well, the, that's the other one. The, the consequence for it, we did increase that consequence. So if you don't turn your cell phone in and we catch you with it during the day, then the first offense, the first offense up to this point has been a warning, you know, we generally call the parents, but you can pick it up in the office at the end of the day. We're going to up the second offense to being first offense consequences, a parent has to come pick it up. And um, you, it's a, a day of ISS for a first offense. And the reason for that is we're going to, we're going to let them know, we're going to give them every opportunity to do that. And it may come with some privileges. During advisory, every once in a while, we say, okay, how about let's do some controlled cell phone use, and here are the rules to that, and you let them have it for 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the day to start trying to teach them some of those skills that, that we want them to have by the time they just get turned loose with them. And how many cell phones do you think would be, I mean, you said there's 266 kids roughly that have them, so there's going to be a few thousand or dollars worth of cell phones in a $40 case? With no camera on it because there's no cameras in the in the <laughs> well, room. Again, I mean, are the teachers comfortable with that? They are, and I polled my teachers. I sent them a survey. Um, I have 30, 32 certified staff, and 15 of them responded, and I didn't have any negative responses. There were no concerns about that. And generally, that's the other thing about the kids in our age bracket. I can put something behind my desk and say, and, and you stay out from behind my desk, and and if it's locked, they're. It, they're monitored closely enough, you know, my, our teachers don't just leave them alone in the classroom for 30 minutes at a time or anything, but um, the students will respect that and we don't have a lot of problem with that because who doesn't know that almost every cell phone you've got it tracked and I can trace it, um, you know, yeah. using another phone. But we don't have a... We're not going to go through lockers, we're not going to go through duffel bags, nope. we're not going to... We're not going to search students, but if I can obviously see that you've got a cell phone hanging out of your back pocket, then that's a problem. <laughs> or if it goes off during class, or so, if I walk into the bathroom okay. and you're standing and they're texting. Then. So the parents are going to argue that, well, my student may have had his phone, but it was turned off and it was in his back pocket and he never had it out, and you're punishing him. Well, it's... it's uh, right? 
but he wasn't. That's, that's what would happen. Yeah. And, and if we add this to the policy, that is what would happen because it would be policy. It's just like if they have it, they whip it out during the middle of class right now and start talking but, but, about but, it. But, but then they're actively doing something. I'm talking about a student who's not actively doing anything except walking down the hallway. With then the put it, if you're not said, doing if the anything rule, with the But if the, the rule policy. changes to put it in the lockbox, then they need to put it in the lockbox. I, I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah, I'm just, just trying to look at how this thing plays out yeah, in the community. I get that. And uh, I've thought about those things, too. I have, I what, have about, what, what, what about... And I don't mean to ask about an impossibility here. So, what about the possibility of breaking it at the, between sixth and seventh grade? Have you thought about have one rule for that. fifth and sixth, another rule for seventh and eighth? I have thought about that. Um, we don't have as many issues with the fifth and sixth graders because, again, they're just more compliant. Our fifth graders are basically like elementary kids. I mean, they like us, and and they will do what we ask them to do. A lot. We hardly ever have this. So the seventh and eighth grade also no problem. It is primarily, truly, it's primarily a seventh and eighth grade problem. I will not lie about that. We do have no, some don't. issues in the sixth grade once in a while. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, agreed. That's that could be another possibility. Okay, one question I have, Doctor Spencer, is what what about kids who are who are playing sports and they may need to leave school early? Say they have to leave at two o'clock. Okay, so maybe in that case, we remind them in the morning, hey, you have to leave early for a baseball game. All of the baseball players need to check their phones in at the office lockbox, and that way, when they leave, they can Just grab we can grab them on the way out. So, and not something I had thought about. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you guys have asked most of the questions. I, I, I've still got a few okay. questions concerned. What about, okay, so these teachers are going to be, these phones are just going to be rushing in and sticking these in these lock boxes. Who's looking them over for damage before they go in there? Well, they shouldn't need to really be looked over because you're putting them in there. Nobody's touching them after you put them in there. That door gets locked. I, under um, I understand that in theory, but what happens when little Johnny pulls it out and says, hey, my screen's broke. It wasn't broke this morning. Mm -hmm. Who can verify that it wasn't? And then mom, mom or dad's going to be up there and say, hey, right. my kid's phone was broken, you're in your lockbox. You know, somebody, somebody, the wrong person grabbed it, dropped it, did, hey, Johnny, here's, oh, that's not mine, that's, and, and you know, because this is going to happen really quick. If, yeah, um, um, and I guess one. I, I see that as a problem. The other problem I see is that now we're responsible for $100,000, $150,000 worth of phones every day. Right, and I, I can see both of those issues. I guess as a classroom teacher, I would I would have my lockbox labeled by shelf, and I would hand that phone to that kid myself. I wouldn't let them just walk up there and. Are, grab are all your teachers that responsible? Um, I'm not going to say all of them, but I would say <laughs> if I tell them, don't let the kids do that, and you do that, um, ninety. Eight percent of them would be. <laughs> right. right. Um, what? Well, I'm, right. what? I'm yeah, sorry. I mean, no, I mean if, if Susie comes in at seven forty-five, as soon as you blow the whistle and puts her phone in there, and Billy comes in at seven fifty-five because Billy's been playing ball. Billy takes Susie's phone. I mean, well, that's they, the kind they of thing to, that happens, They have to right? come in the building when I put the get them in the building. <laughs> so, I'm just saying there's a you know. there's a, at least a 10 or 15 minute window there that different kids yeah. are going to be accessing the same box. All things that we will have to, to kind of work the, the kinks out of. Um, How common is it for kids to be tardy in the morning, late into school, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes late? A lot. Okay, what do you do then? Um, they put, would put them in the office lockbox and then they would come back there to get them after the 3 o'clock bell, not, not interrupting advisory time. Okay. So, and with um, the penalty of being light, I guess. Right so. now, is it, is it still policy? If, if, if I have something I need to bring to my kid during the middle of the day, what do I, what's the process right now? Right now, we're still going with our, um, our uh, opening plan and you ring the buzzer and either somebody comes down and gets it if it's not something you can set there we have a basket down there and if you can leave it the basket if it's paperwork we generally have somebody there this is pretty much due to COVID correct it uh, is but it's, it's also something that um, in talking to officer Moore that um, it's also good safety procedure not mm -hmm. to just let people in the building assuming it's a parent mm -hmm. um, you know they have to kind of they have to tell you what they're okay. out there for. So we're going to have roughly 25 or 30 phones in each lockbox, is that? No, our advisory classes, every teacher in the building has an advisory class, and we try to keep them under 15. Okay. I don't know that I'd want my phone locked up with 15 other people, of those kids' phones, uh, right in here in close contact, and then tonight I'm going to take it and stick it here in my mouth. Right. Uh, and, and, you do, know, do you? I'm, well, they, they each have a separate shelf. I personally wouldn't have a problem with it, but here's my view as a parent with a student who's going to be in my building this year, and I know it's easy to say, but you're there with him every day. But even if I weren't, I would be okay sending my child to school every day without a phone, because there's a phone in the office. If I need to call and get him a message, 
That's what Stacy is for. She takes message conscientiously and she gives them to those students. I would be okay never sending my student to school with a phone, even right. if I worked somewhere else. I would. I don't disagree with you on anything what you've said that there's a problem here, but I, I just really don't feel this is the answer. Okay. That's just my personal. Okay. That's my the answer. Matt, was have you got anything? For. I've not heard from you. Yeah, I, I fully support you and all of your teachers with the cell phone deal. It's a major concern with me and my daughter. We fight the screen time continually. And it's something that I think every parent should be concerned about. I don't think they should just hand that thing over and just, you know, it, it, they're just they're too young for that. I have, I don't, I have issues with the locking, the taking ownership of the phones and taking them away. Um, for me, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, looking at the school, the teachers taking that ownership, having those phones. I think there's too many issues with it. Obviously, it's been done somewhere else successfully. Um, but me personally, I, I support you, but I, I, I can't get there with it. Okay, so here's what my question to you is. Can I say something real quick? No, sir. No, no it's oh, a right. meeting right now. There'll be a, there'll be a spot for comments from guests later in the meeting. Um, here's my question to you then. If this isn't something that you can get behind, as a board, you know that we have a problem that is interfering with instruction in our building. I am open to suggestions. So if you can think of something that is a better solution that you could get behind as a parent and a board, then I would love to hear that um, because truly right now in our building we have a problem that is interfering with the quality and the amount of time our spent, our, a lot of our kids are spending in, in instruction. So I am open for suggestions. Truly I am. Um, I'm just looking for a solution. Right. I understand that. And, and we're not the only school. I, I would I would just, I wager the farm that 100% of those middle schools in the, in the nation are having the same issues. Um, and my problem is we've got one school that you said that you know of that has tried this. I'm wondering what other schools are doing. If we've explored that, looked into that, seen what some other people are doing, other than just one school that has tried this, and that's what we're going to want to yeah, run. Yeah, and I will. I keep my ears open for that when I go to conferences. I have a lot of friends who are administrators. I've been doing mm -hmm. this since 1992, so I know a lot of people out there. Sure. And the SCA um, <coughs> Middle School Principals Group. This is a constant discussion. We, we have sent around, okay, so what's, what's your policy? What's your consequence policy? But again, I don't like to approach, approach it from what are we going to do to them when. Um, our policy is in alignment with most of theirs. Most of them have a, a warning and then it goes to parent pickup and ISS and, and on from there. Um, and I always look at those schools because they're close to us. They have the same cultural area. You know, we're, we have the most in common with them. So they're all floating this question too, and also, you know, is there a solution for how do you get them to just put them away and leave them away? Um, because it is, it's interfering with our instruction. And but again, it's... When that happens, Dr. Spencer, and, and the first part of the policy is you call the parent and they confiscate the phone, they come pick up the phone. Our first, our first step right now is simply a warning, and um, the student does get written up for a discipline referral, so it goes in the computer that they have that warning. The parent gets a letter for that um, when we do those, I think we do them weekly. And um, the student can pick up the phone in the office at the end of the day. And that's the 43 documented? That's that part of it. Okay. That doesn't include the kid that the teacher said, hand me your cell phone, so I'll turn it into the office. So 43 letters been sent out. Yeah, but that, is that kid likely to turn his cell phone in anyways? It's going to be the kids that are compliant. I mean, that non-compliant kid, he's not going to walk he's in in the first of the morning and be like, oh, here's my cell phone. You know, he's not um, willing to give it to you when you're asking for it. Maybe not, maybe not. I, like I said, this, this, is, this is a solution that has worked for another school, and I was, I'm looking for a solution, so I am open to whatever solutions that we can come. I also, I don't want to put my teachers in, in a bad position, because other, I mean, I, I know of other schools that, um, and even in the high school, some of the teachers will have just like um, the little pocket things, and you can put your phone there at the beginning of the hour, and then you get it back at the end of the hour. Um, I don't feel like in my building that's a secure way to do things just because, again, the age of the student and the difference in the... Not even when they walk into the classroom, put it in that uh, folder. Then I think it's more likely it. that I would walk out with somebody else's phone or that somebody else would grab a phone and drop it in that scenario. That's even more shuffle. I think so. Uh, I think so. If we did that every hour, I think it would be even more. Seven times yeah. instead of <laughs> once. I, mean, I think, I think the, between yeah. the, those options, I'd rather have it in a secure box. That way you can kind of work that. But now, the second time, at what point do you take it away and parents have to come to you? The second time they get caught with it, um, the that's a day of ISS and the parents have to come pick it up. And then most certainly when the parents come and pick it up, obviously the kids never come back with it again. <laughs> Those, because the uh, parents are so yeah. upset about them not following the rules <laughs> that they don't I get wish. that cell phone back. I wish. Is that um, about right? No, um, generally, 
we have a lot of repeat offenders with that. We have we have students who are up to their third, fourth, fifth day in ISS because of. So instead of putting them in ISS, why don't we just say after two ISS offenses, you don't get to bring your phone back? So then, why, not, why don't we punish the kids that are violating the rules? Because they're instead all of everybody. a lot of them. It's not, we're not talking about five kids here. We're talking about well, several. But, but, but they'd learn pretty quick, wouldn't yeah. they? I and, and, and it would I serve know. the same purpose. You'd solve your problem. But I'm not sure you're going to keep them from bringing their cell, not bringing the cell phone back. But you that's know, that's I'm not sure you're going to be able to get them to turn it into a little box. Yeah. yeah. But, that, but you know, also when you say you can't bring it, that's when you get into that issue of okay, now I need to search your bag, turn your pockets inside out because you know. But that's if they're caught, though. That's if they're if they're I'm, caught. I'm not yeah. saying look yeah. for their bag. You know, but yeah. if you hit the second and third suspension, then a lot of them get or ISS and why do you got to search them? Then you got to search them when they walk in the building. Okay, well, so well, I, don't I, want to, I, I, I have not said anything yet, and I understand completely what you're dealing with. Uh, it, it began before I retired. And uh, I had cell phones really? back then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was the best thing going there. They were the big bag phones. Yeah. Bag phones. And they carried them around like that. Yeah. 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 Whenever I uh, read this, I uh, my first concern was uh, <coughs> how much, how complicated was it going to get for teachers? And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's my and, concern, too. Yeah. It, it was, I know. And, uh, and I'm sure, you know, you've talk to teachers about you know this and uh, that the trade-off is okay I spend some time dealing with the phone at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day or I have to deal with phones all day long uh, and you know so it's kind of a trade-off uh, you know our, our, we're either going to have the disruption to the educational process and it is a pain and it, I mean, and your point about you know, the kid's mind is going to be on that phone. Uh, and if it vibrates, you know, their mind is not going to be, you know, what's My going watch on just switched, and I lost you there for a minute because yeah. I just got a cell phone message. Yeah, and, um, you know, and, and the same way with all of us. So you're trading that disruption for the possible problems that we've all heard about, you know, that we don't know are going to happen, but they could happen. You know, a broken cell phone, uh, you know, kids not turn their phone in or whatever. Um, so those are the things you deal with. If, if you have this, you figure it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But, uh, but I do I, not want to, I don't want to make an investment. The boxes themselves, to, with a decent box with a lock on it's in the $40 range. And I don't want to make that investment for every teacher in the building for it to be a, a, a one-year thing and then find out then that at the end of the year you guys are, have so many complaints and it's not anything that you can support again. Um, it is, it's just one more thing that the teachers are required to monitor that we weren't, we didn't deal with this 15 years ago. Right. It's one more thing that we deal with in the classrooms on top of all the things that we've always dealt with. Um, we're trying to teach math and science and social studies and English and, and it's just one more thing that you have to feel, you feel like you are constantly on trying to figure out why that kid isn't paying attention. Um, and again, a lot of them have these now, and if they're in the same room as their cell phone, because most of theirs aren't the expensive cell, cell capable kind, they're the ones that are hooked to their phone, um, then, you know, if they're in the same room, they're sitting right there by, then they can just look at their watch and, and do the same thing. Right, so, so how are you gonna manage that piece? Uh, yes. Well, it would probably only work if they were in their, room, in their advisory room during the time, because it has to, you know, you have to be within so many feet, but, um, uh, it doesn't sound like the majority of you can get behind this, and I don't want to do something that when parents come to you, um, because they, again, they don't come to me, because these are reasonable policies. Don't send your t kid to school with a cell phone or tell them, keep that cell phone put away. Um, but they're reasonable policies, but if, um, when parents come to you with them, they don't always sound reasonable with that consequence, or with that particular kid. I know that. So if you can't get behind it, um, when, when you have it brought to you, then I don't want to do something that, you know, is not something that you can support. But again, I like solutions, so if you can think of any or if you hear of any, and I will continue to work on this on my end also and look for schools that are doing things that work because what we're doing right now is not working. Have, have you talked to or many of the schools? Is anybody allowing them to use some phones at different times? Um, is there many schools that do that? Because that was the first thought that crossed my mind. Instead of telling them, we're telling them no, not at all, and then we're having problems with them. I, you know, 
I, I just wonder if we allow them to use them some, would that alleviate the times that they're not? So would that help? I know it's not going to eliminate it. I'm I not don't that think naive. it is. Um, you know, we let it, we're, like I said, it's just a little bit. We let our eighth graders use them one day a week during lunch, just a little. Privilege. Yeah, but I'm talking about yeah. every day. Use them at um, lunchtime or using them. You know, I don't know what the schedule would allow for. You know, I, well, I don't have any class time to give up for it. Sure. Um, at lunchtime, we have 20 minutes for lunch, and I'd really just assume they eat and get that done and get their trays put up. Um, it does make them really quiet. My eighth graders are really quiet on Fridays. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not sure I would be in favor of giving them a set aside structured time just to use their cell phone. Yeah, I don't know that that's what we want yeah. to devote our school day to. When well, I that's not what I'm saying. But Marty, what do you what what do you do as far as cell phones? When are they allowed to use them in your building? Before <coughs> before and after school and passing times. Yeah. Lunch. If we let basically them, any non-instructional. Sure. Yeah. But that, that's again, what I'm we're, saying. We're I'm not. I'm ways. not saying a lot times for them. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can see problems that will arise with that. Also, um, I I am not in favor of letting them have them every day at lunch, especially our younger kids. Our, our eighth graders could probably handle it. Some of our seventh graders, but seventh grade is a really hard year for discipline anyway, and they do a lot of of things that they don't think about consequences for, and the more access they have to things to make poor decisions, I think sometimes the more poor decisions we get at that age, just because that year is such a huge developmental year for them. Um, I don't really have any other unstructured times uh, recess, but then I would really worry about phone damage if they had them out at recess, and, and about the lack of ability to monitor them, because we have three people supervising recess, which is plenty if they're playing, but um, who knows what they're doing on their cell phones, you know, if, and, and that's not ours to monitor. It's not my place to monitor if your kid's watching inappropriate videos right, on I a cell phone. That. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I just, uh, it's a little hard for me to fathom sometimes what we're, what we're doing when we just hand them this thing that accesses everything in the world yep. to a 10 year old and say, here you go, go off to school. and. Um, I think about what my parents would have done if I had even asked to take something that cost $100 to school. Of course, I'm old, so. Um, well, to Max's yeah. point, and this this is a this is an issue that there's not a there's not a right answer to. No. I mean, I've, no. I've been I've seen schools that do more more structure, more restrictive, and they work and they don't work. I've seen schools just more lax, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. There's not the right answer, right. you know. But I do applaud the fact that you're trying to solve the problem. We are trying. And you're not ignoring um, it. I, I, that's extremely important. And I'm not saying this is the be-all, end-all answer, and you need to agree to it. I truly, if you hear of things that are working, I have talked to schools that allow cell phones at the middle school level during passing times. Their teachers are not in favor of that. They say it causes more problems than it fixes. Um, they, they're just... They I would imagine a lot of the drama that happens, especially in middle school, and I'm sure some in high school, okay is directly related to cell phone well, communication. Well, and so much of what we get, you know, we, we deal with calls regularly about this child is bullying my child on social media, and thank goodness, you know, the answer to that most of the time is, but it's happening after school, because then it's not ours to deal with. We do report it to Officer Moore and, and Dylan Carter, but if it's happening at school because they've all got their cell phones out, then it's our problem to deal with, and that's <coughs> another <coughs> discipline issue, and that's a more serious discipline issue a lot of times depending on the media they're using and what they're doing with it and how many people are accessing it. So um, it's just a matter of that developmental age in my building, and it's hard. It really is. We probably spend half of our time on instruction and half of our time on social-emotional development, and Matt can probably tell you that, too. That's never changed. Um, they're just going through this big old change that kind of levels out about the age of 15 and then um, doesn't really completely get over with until about the age of 25 and it's all brain development it's all brain development yep. so thank you for your time I know I took up a lot um, I do appreciate your input and as parents um, I welcome this conversation to continue um, because a lot of you do have kids in my building so. so dr. Spencer based on the conversation is it your position that you're not going to proceed forward with this I don't feel like I have the board support to do okay. that right now do you agree okay. with that I would agree with that and so then I would ask the board then when we get down to the action items that we just don't take action on that particular item yeah. Okay.
Because I think she has consensus of the board. Could, could you do us a favor? And yeah. you're part of the SCA middle school principals, uh -huh. whatever. Could could you poll them and just see what they're what what they're what they're all doing with cell phone policy right now? If they allow, if they don't allow, and maybe send us uh, an email out to the board once you. I will do that, and I'll send it to Mr. Hall. We're all agreeing agree with you. Is an issue. I know yeah, that you agree that it's an issue, yeah. and I know that when you have kids in my building, that it's a, an issue you're dealing with at home too. You know, um, I'm. I know our daughter is allowed to have hers out <laughs> and everything, and there's consequences at home. Something I would ask you to do. Um, I posted it on Facebook, and um, it's on the middle school Facebook page. There is a podcast, and it's 41 minutes long, but man, is it good! And it talks about what social media is. Um, that it's not all bad. It's not a slam on social media, but it talks about some of the consequences that we're seeing, and it's particularly harsh on middle school girls. Mm -hmm. That there's about three years in there that for middle school girls, social media is the things that they do to each other on it, and the things that people do to them is just so detrimental to mm -hmm. them. And it's a really good podcast, and it's interesting. It's got a lot of good research behind it. So if you get a minute, listen to it. Uh, if you are going to send out that uh, summary that. Tony asked for, would you include the cell phone misuse consequence out of the discipline code, just that section of it? You bet. You bet. So that I've got that in front of me. I can do that. Thank you. Did anybody Thank else you. get a text message while it was going on if they wanted to check that they were kind of nervous? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hey, check mine because it looked important. I have my cell phone in the vehicle and I have been paying so much attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I need one of your phones. Hold on, how about you? Which is the idea? To teach Pinky how to keep up with her phone. Uh, well, <laughs> they could do that because I promise you, I, I bet Kaylee knows where her phone is right now. It's right there where it's probably been all day. I have a couple of quick comments. Go ahead. First of all, I had a text message while you were talking, and I did not look at it. <laughs> okay, because I knew that I'd lose track. And I wish you'd answer because I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but a couple of things that you said that Mac touched on is the drama that happens with the cell phone use. I also was starting to deal with that. It was the flip phones more than at that time. <laughs> About their mind being on stuff, I was also the basketball coach when that was gone, and we had a rule when they got on the bus, they put their cell phone in a duffel bag, and they did not have their cell phone before a basketball game because the mind thing again. Yeah. So, and, and truly, I, brain research shows that, that you cannot do two things at once. Right. I know you think you can, but you can't do. Both of them well. So I sympathize with you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that you are understanding. I'm just looking for solutions. Now, was that before or after Scott was on your team? We didn't have, we didn't have cell phones. Because he was a smart signal. I don't know. When he came in tonight, he said something about running all kinds of lines for you or something. I don't know. We ran. No, we had to be too busy running. <laughs> all right. Um, we're going to talk about uh, moving high school and middle school softball to uh, well, not no, middle school softball is already in the spring. Okay, the high school softball. softball. Right now, high school softball is a fall sport, um, and I, Dr. Spence obviously can speak to this as well. Well, the principal plus he also has a daughter who's playing. But I think part of this is the fact that uh, we have it's going to get to the point where we're going to be the only SCA school that's currently playing softball in the fall. And so you have a proposal before you that we, where we would, beginning next year, we would still play our fall schedule. But then we would have a modified spring schedule. The fall schedule, we already have contracts in place, so we want, to, we want to be respectful of those and the teams that we have contracts with. And then we would pick up whatever games we could pick up in the spring. Uh, in the spring, probably pick up the SA schools that were, were playing ball at that time. So for one year, the girls that are in softball would be playing basically two seasons of sport. They played in fall and then play in spring. And then the following year, it would just be a spring sport. And now some of the things that we're going to have to take a look at, cost is not a huge issue. I mean, for one year, we're going to have to have an additional coach. Uh, and then beyond that, we are going to have to look at upgrading our facilities. Because right now, we basically have one softball field and one baseball field uh, for two baseball programs and a, and, a, and a middle school softball program at the same time. Now we're going to have one softball field, one baseball field for two middle school softball, for a middle school softball and a high school softball program, and a middle school baseball program and a high school baseball program. Obviously, it's going to be an issue. And so we're looking at, and I've already met with uh, Mr. James and, and, and Josh Owens uh, at the T-ball field, just, uh, just adjacent to Mumford Gym to see what we can do to put up fencing there that would go down the first baseline and, and, and a third baseline, kind of reconfigure the, uh, 
uh, the field so we're not hitting too many balls over on Caldwell's house. Uh, we're even looking at doing some type of netting to keep that from happening to where we can make that, to begin with, a nice practice facility. At some point in time, I'd like to see us include bringing portable bleachers, maybe a small score, a scoreboard that we could actually have games there. And I think it'd be good for the community as well because that particular facility could be used during the summer also. And so I think we have that. I don't see that as a huge cost item uh, right now, having to upgrade that. And I think it's something that we, we need to do anyway. So with that, I don't know if the board has any questions about the rationale about moving it from fall to spring. Dr. Spence, I didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to add to it, either as an administrator or a parent. Thoughts? Well, I think it's a win-win, and I, I think especially this season would be beneficial to our to all programs involved, with maybe the exception of a track in the spring. But um, our softball program would benefit from it. And the fact that uh, every <coughs> SCA school is moving to spring, it makes sense that we're not out on an island. Um, but Robert, some ways went ahead and made contracts with schools so we could honor those in the fall and uh, and then roll over to the spring and be ready to go in the spring. You don't think it affect the track too much? I'm sorry? You don't think track would lose too many kids? They would lose a, a couple. We talked with Coach Wagner and, um, you know, there, we may work out a, an athlete sharing type of thing where, where kids could compete in both if they chose. I've, I've been involved in districts that allow dual participation, and it, it can work. It just depends on the sports. Uh, I think softball and track would be a good partnership because softball is a team sport and track is more of an individual sport, and so it kind of works. Uh, I've seen cross country and football work because, again, an individual sport versus a team sport. I think there are some that don't lend themselves very well toward that, but I think in this case, I think this would be one where, where I think it would be fine. And I think. Coach Wagner would be more than willing to share athletes, and, and it just takes a, a young person who's very dedicated and committed and prioritizes well. I mean, that's a big deal because they they have to be able to manage their time. So, but it can be done. What about? And I don't think this would be an issue, but I just want to make sure. Um, I know there's something I forget what the deal is, but if you offer a male sport, you've got to offer a, a female sport. We've run out of that before. It is with us offering that twice a year. Will there be there be any problems there? You know, because we're, we're really offering twice in one year. Yeah, we're really not technically offering it twice because we're only competing. Like this coming year, we would compete in districts, and, and Misha would recognize this still as a fall okay. sport. We would be doing exhibition games in the spring. SCA schools, yeah. and I mean, we would play for an SCA, but it, it would not be Misha. Okay. Right. And, I don't and want they're sure. okay with that. I, okay. I mean, schools, uh, we wouldn't be a lot of schools. <coughs> and in that okay. spring side, we would not be participating in Correct. postseason. There'd be no championship right. season okay. in the spring. So the postseason would still occur in the fall. Right. This first year. Right. And, and then, then we would switch to spring and fall. Okay. Now with a uh, upgraded facility up there, would that be something that could be shared costs with the Y since they use it? Possibly. I mean, I could approach Terry and see if there's any interest in doing that. Um, I would guess that their resources are probably more limited than ours are, and the fact that it's on school property, I wouldn't have a problem trying to get estimates and see what we can do do a loan on it. But they, I mean, if they're interested in doing a cost share on it, that's fine. I just know that they don't have the resources at the school district. I didn't apparently did, but I didn't know programs being sure. national wide or something to sure. figure this out. Well, and it's, it's a little bit different than the, the cost share between the city and the school because we both have fairly good budgets that we can do that with, but the why they don't have as much, and so I think it would be difficult. I can approach Terry, but I, I wouldn't push the issue because I still right. think it would be something that it's on our property. I think we could do something that would be good for our kids, but then I think it would be good for the community mm -hmm. as well. Right. So I think that's a good thing. Well, they use our facility for basketball too, anyway, don't they? Yes. Yeah, well, the wide is just to do. What about, um, I haven't paid attention, but that, I know at, at Booster Field, back behind a softball field, is there room for another field in there? Or is that, I know there's a pretty good size area, but I've never just really paid I don't know if it'd be big enough. And that'd be the track, walking track, and those more oil trees. And yeah, isn't that where, trees you get to the, the, the Mighty Mites and practice and stuff? Mm -hmm. you talk, that's about where the Mighty Mites practice, isn't it? It's yeah. on the outfield, outside the field, outside yes. the softball yeah. field, correct? Right. But, but there is, there's a line of trees that goes right through the center of that, yeah. okay. of that open area. That oh, the moral trees. Okay. Correct. Quick. So, middle school, softball, baseball, or whatever, that, that's here. That's happening. That's not going yes. anywhere. Is there much difference in cost between 
upgrading to a practice field versus upgrading it to something where they can, like you said, portable bleachers and stuff? Mm -hmm. Is there is there a tremendous difference in that? I mean, if we've got if we're going to do something, why yeah. don't we just do no, this? Dugouts, dugouts would be one of the things too. Yeah, yeah I mean that'd be an additional. I mean that's what you need mainly for the games. Restrooms. So. I don't know. I mean, we haven't really put thoughts to it. I mean, fence. I mean, I I just shot a number out to Robert today, and I just told it's totally arbitrary. I said, I don't know, maybe twenty thousand. And he thought, well, that's kind of high. I, I don't think so. Once you start looking at the fence, we need a home run, or we need an outfield fence, some type of netting, dugouts. I think the dugouts down at Booster were built, were built by parents, or it's yeah. a senior project or something, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. they were built by parents. parents. Yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah. So I think there's some but, things that we can do there. But, but plumbing is a big issue. That's not something yeah. that. As there's water water there. If, there's if water. you're going to put bathrooms yes. in there, oh, there's yeah. water down there. Yeah, yeah I'm not, so so much, I, I wouldn't think in bathrooms. <laughs> well, I, mean, I know what you're saying. I, know, that's, that's, I get it. I get it. But that's a pretty, <laughs> when you start talking plumbing, that's going to. That's well, actually uh, a big deal. I wonder about your netting, too, because right now, first baseline goes right at his garage. Uh, Right, I mean, right at it. Yeah, we're so facing it's got a big turn. No, we're turning it the other gonna, way. I still think you're probably going to have to put some kind of big netting or something up there. I don't know. Yeah, when we went and looked at it, we were looking at taking the home plate and moving it more toward Mumford. Right. And, and moving it as it's kind of, if you straight deadway center field would be Mumford, basically. And then you'd go first and, and, and at third base line from there. Went to Mountain View's ball game. And they have one of those nets going across. Well, you were there, and that uh, behind the the backstop, and they have them between the two light poles because it goes much higher than the backstop does itself. Right. Still didn't keep a lot of balls from going out on the no. first base side and, and busting up windows <laughs> and stuff. But beyond that, There's a lot of cars. Yeah, night. but I mean, but they do make the net, and there's a way to do it. And right. We just would need to figure it out because we're going to have to figure out how to, to keep those balls from going over there. Well, we're going to be replacing windows in the roof every now and then, like once a year or something. Well, and if you turn the field too, you might not have to look quite directly into the sun too. Right? Correct. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But I think either way, irrespective of moving softball, I think having another practice facility is necessary. Yeah, you've got you're, you've got four teams on to play at the same time practice. Right. Yeah. So I think go ahead. When we vote, we vote for practice, or we vote and just go for a whole field. Well, we're, we're just voting for softball right now. Yeah, we're, we're, voting voting the, uh, we're voting to move it to spring. Yeah. I'm just curious yeah. you know, if there was a huge difference. No. Or, I mean, if we're going to do something, why not just set up? I agree. No, I totally, I totally agree. And I think that we I think we need to start making a practice facility. And I think we need to move it into something where people can actually use, use it competitively. Right. We're just flush with cash. Because of business, well, I don't know about flush with cash. <laughs> but I, I, I think, think it sounds COVID-related. I mean, spreading it all out. Social distancing. <laughs> I, you know, there's always a way to do it. But uh, but I do think that it would be good to have, I mean, we could we could have middle school softball and middle school baseball games down there. Right. That's so that would be, that would if, help if a lot. If that's here to stay, then Correct. Yeah, why not just look at all the games. Correct. Yeah. So, and that's something that we can kind of look at down the road. If we decide, if the board decides to go ahead and agree to move it to the spring, then I'd like to start working on that that practice facility this fall. Right. Sure. So, so we that's have a, something ready. You know, that's all. You know, if the practice facility is five thousand and, and right. looking at a game is seventy five thousand, those are two well, yeah, different exactly. things we'd have to look at. Exactly. Do we have the resources and the time to get that done this summer with everything else we've got to do? Well, as far as this summer, I'm looking at this fall. You know, I think hopefully by the time school starts, then that'll free up our maintenance guys and our grounds guys to maybe focus on this as well. And do this, so I, it's nothing I, I want to tackle during the summer because there's too many other things going on right now to be able to do that. So, I have a question for Marty. Marty, yeah. what's our what's is the push all because of volleyball? Is that why they're moving to that's what Robert spring? has told me that the ADs have said that the volleyball is is driving it, that they want their athletes, their softball athletes, to be playing volleyball. And so, you kick softball to spring, and that opens up. Do you know how that's doing statewide? Because you used to be. Like yeah, half and half. He says it's evening to, out, um, it's, and, I, and around here it's it's, it's tilting tilt, tilting towards spring. I, I, I wish Misha would pick and just say this is when we're doing softball, right, right. either spring or fall. Right. That's the only sport that the school can choose which one they. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me that right. schools well, choose that, but the choice is trending more towards spring now. Yeah. I just always thought the weather was much better in fall to play. Uh, right now, I like ball softball. Uh, yes, but, but, but yeah, what are you going to do only, if the rest of the conference is moving? Right, the only SCA yeah. school. I, I agree. On the choice. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um,
last month we had a, a request to uh, allow virtual students, virtual and homeschool students, to participate in extracurricular and co-curricular activities. We told them we would take that under advisement and have a discussion about that. So tonight is our night that we can discuss that. Um, let Mr. Hall and probably uh, Marty weigh in on that with their with, with, with what you all have. Uh, Come up with sure, and and and, and, and I'll, I'll I can say a few things, and I know Dr. Spence definitely has uh, some ideas as well. But you know, our practice has always been that you have to be a full-time treated student to participate in extracurricular co-curricular activities. And part of the reason for that is because there's an issue of equity when it comes to eligibility, academic eligibility, especially when you start talking sports, because uh, right now all of our seated students are held to one specific standard. And we can control that standard because they're all taking the same classes at the same school by the same teachers. When you have, uh, when you have other students are allowed to participate, then you have a difficult time controlling that academic eligibility. That's just one reason. So I think the other thing is that I know a lot of coaches would like to ensure that uh, if it's a team sport that they, they have all the kids around together during the day as part of the team to build that team concept and that team unity. You don't necessarily have that if you have students who are participating who aren't necessarily involved in, in who aren't going attending school during the day. And so I think it's hard to make that connection as well. Um, it's always been from my standpoint, and, and, and right now it's a local decision. Um, the state has not yet passed any type of legislation that would basically require schools to do this or not be part of the mission. So since that's been our last past practice, and since that, um, since it is a local decision, I would, I would ask that my recommendation would be that we stay and we continue with the current practice. Of, of you have to be a full-time seated student to participate in extracurricular or co-curricular activities. And that, that's my two cents worth. I don't know, Dr. Spence, I think you have I concur your thoughts with, as well. with everything that, that Mr. Hall said. I feel that if you want to participate, then you need to be a seated student. Is, is it necessary to uh, lump homeschool and virtual students together, or could you separate them and allow one and not the other. You could. I mean, I think with homeschool it's even more difficult because there's, yeah, I, I do too. there's yeah. absolutely no control over right. any homeschool child whatsoever. And with the virtual school, though, right. I mean, as far as the academic side, I think that those standards are pretty high. Aren't they? Except on the virtual side, we don't control the virtual instruction, all right? right. And, and so that's actually the grade that's given by another teacher in another location that's not part of our system. So you still have that. But it is approved by the state. The, yeah, through MOCAP. <laughs> the virtual is, absolutely. Absolutely it is. So, and, and they're the ones that approve ours, right? The state. Approve our what? Curriculum. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and they're the same standard. They approve the providers, okay? They approve the MOCAP providers, all right? Um, the other thing would be, but you still don't have the idea that the, the student being in school around the other kids to where you can build that team concept, if it's a sport. For instance, so you don't have that. Mm -hmm. So, but to answer your question, yeah, you could make a distinction between virtual the, and homeschool. Sure. The, the co-curricular looks like it would be very sticky, very tricky to try to get those kids into um, involved because you're talking about what well, you're talking about like FFA and and band well, and co-curricular would be any yeah exactly any class that's at all both an activity and a class. So, so so they get a grade for it. Right. So I mean those would be nearly I, I say those would be nearly impossible because those kids would have to be here. You know, to be an FFA, you're gonna have to be in here and take one of our, our uh, ag classes. You know, they do stuff for FFA in there. Right. Um, and same with, with band and, and choir and I don't know what all's involved in co curricular, just ones that come to mind. But I could see where that would be a real problem. Why did you point on FFA? I'm not sure I understand how that would be the same for band um, because it's not not the same kind of seated instruction, right? Well, it is. It's, well, they have the class. That's, that's the they have though. to be there, yeah, right? right. Well, I mean, they would have they to be there for that period of time. They yeah. wouldn't be there. Well, yes, I mean, in order to participate in games, they have to be at the games too, right? And they have to be at the practices. So, but those I mean, are they all, still have to be there. But those are all after school activities. But that doesn't matter to these kids because. They're not doing anything else. So, I mean, they're they're at home doing virtual instruction, so they're free to come from eleven thirty to. So you're saying then they would they would come and be a seated seated student. They would at come that time. for band, for band and they would come for. FFA, I, don't, I don't see how they do FFA, FFA but I can see how they could come for band and choir. Right. Or, I mean, I, 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 I get your some point. Of I get your point there. I was thinking more of they're not coming to our facilities for anything. Right, but they would have to come to our facility for that piece of it. Yeah, and, and I think Max got a good point. I mean, I think you can parse this out a little bit. 
I'm not there with homeschool students, but with virtual students, their educational is coming through our buildings, right? We're seeing those scores. They're on our rolls. Like they're on our rolls. Okay. And, and, you know, they're in our district. Their parents are paying taxes. <coughs> and, you know, at the end of the day, the question is, is it good for kids? Right? Mm -hmm. So is it good for these kids that are at home and not interacting with other students? Is it good to bring them into our school and have them interact with other students? That doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. I get the point about uh, you know them not being at school and being with the rest of the kids that are on the same team and, right. and so on, I, and how that could create some you know I don't know problem <laughs> uh, you know where but I also see I think what Dean's saying is that there could be on the other side a real good experience for the for the people the kids that are that are not typically around the rest of the students to be around those students at those uh, activities. Um, you know, I, I, I worry about separating groups more than we need to. And this is a, this is a way that we separate, you know, virtual students, homeschool students away from the students that come to our school. If there's a way to bring these people together, I don't, you know, seems like good could come out of that. Right. And I think on the virtual side, I mean, I, I can understand that, uh, but more so than homeschool. Yeah. However, right. that being said, if it is a virtual student and they're enrolled in a co-curricular type class, then they absolutely would need to be held to the same standards and expectations as every other student taking that class. And that means if they have an evening concert, they're expected to be there. Sure. Their grade is dependent upon that, oh, right? Yeah. And so I don't want that. Well, I'm a virtual kid. I don't. I don't really need to come. Or fun, to that. Fundraising you know? or anything. yeah, anything. Like fundraising, anything. Anything that's, that's part, part of that of activity. The, they they're either in or out. They got to be part of, it and they can't pick and choose what part of the activity they they want to be part of. I agree. If they're in it, they're in it. Right. And then also, I think if they get a grade for it, then that grade goes toward their graduation, mm -hmm. because right now virtual students still graduate from Willow Springs High School. And so they have to have so many credits. And so if you're in band or you're in choir and you're not going to the certain number of events that you have to, and you get a poor grade and it impacts your GPA, that's just the way it is, right? Because there's no special exceptions because you're a virtual kid. Sure. Okay? I agree. I agree. And so that's just the way it needs to be. So from that standpoint, I can get on board with that because they are enrolled in our school district. District. It is different for homeschool kids. I agree. Yeah. I absolutely agree. With that. I absolutely what, agree. With what that. about virtual repercussions or, or, or like you know, say a kid misbehaves or it misbehaves during an activity or something like that? I mean, there's consequences when it comes back to the school. You then have no, well, that's you a have no that's a good question. That's a very good question because if it's a virtual kid, and say they're in a co-curricular activity, and say they, if it was a seated kid, and say heaven forbid they were consuming alcohol at an event, right? What would typically happen to that kid when they came back to school? They'd be suspended. They'd be, be suspended. We can't suspend the virtual kid. Why not? Well, they'd be suspended. Why can't from, you? You suspend so from that activity. So then, from so, the activity. so then we will just remove them from the activity. Well, he'd be suspended from that activity because for, it needs to be an for X number of times, and that would affect his grade if there's a grade to be had. It's not a suspension from school. Mm -hmm. Know what you said, Marty? Yes. So you don't suspend the virtual kid from school, right? Just the well, you suspend him from the activity, activity well, during that period of the suspension. Yeah, we we, we jump school. way over to suspension. What yeah. if it's ISS? What if it's detention? What if it's, uh, you know, what What about these smaller repercussions for something? Hey, you're just acting like a jack wagon on the, you know, the field trip or whatever the deal is. Yeah, we wouldn't you have know, the ability. Well, you, you couldn't ISS. You couldn't, you couldn't go to ISS. Then they get, then they but, get no, then they get no, uh, there's, There's no, no repercussions for well, it. Well, but the participation in that activity would be the... But that's that's right, the control. I mean, the whole thing is, is these kids want to participate in these things. They're coming voluntarily. Right. And so, if they misbehave, they don't get to. Yeah. <laughs> Problem solved. Yeah. So, the only, the only issue then is back to this is a school thing, is if they would do something that would get them kicked out of school for two weeks, virtual-wise, what happens? That's that's the difference. If they did something at an athletic event, or they did something that they weren't supposed to, well, they'd be kicked out of the event for the two weeks. Whatever. Right, but they're whatever also out of school. Huh? Right? They're also kicked out of school if they were caught drinking. Yes. Right? Well, a yeah. seated kid would be. Right. A virtual kid would continue their instruction, their education. Right. I just don't see that as being a big issue. Man, um, but where's the limitations? If, if a kid is being 
virtual. They can do their virtual from 8 to 2 in the morning. So does that allow them to come to school all day long just to have fun? They can take 7 8 fun classes and and come and go as they please all day long? No, I don't think so. I mean, is it going to be a limited deal? They just can come pick one band if, or if they want to be banned. Yeah, I mean, they get the same amount of electives as another, as a kid that's in seated school, the same deal? Do they get Because that sounds kind of like fun to me. You know, just well, come to school. They would they get their eight classes. I mean, come and go. What, what you is don't get it more than that. Marty, what, does the state have, you have to be enrolled at the school on so many credits so they could, they could do their whole thing with Misha? Through virtually to be yes to be uh, eligible for admission yes okay. I I don't I don't know what it looks like I don't know what the answers are it, it seems to me that the virtual students and we have seen the kids who are in virtual school so we're on both sides of this coin already uh, I mean we're on one side of it already for example um, and, and I'll tell you, honest to people, guys, I don't think it makes any difference because I think one of these years, in the next very few years, we'll be told to do this. I mean, I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, if you watched the bill that just went through the Senate this week, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is going to happen. So let's get in it and figure it out. I mean, it's good for kids. That's, that's the bottom line is it's good for these kids. So we kind of opened a bigger can of worms tonight than what we started with. Here, here's, here's what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to table this till next month. I'm going to have Marty and Bill and whoever you guys want to get to and study on that. Try to put us a plan together what it would look like if we decided to let the virtual. I think we're all in agreements that homeschool kids. We don't. They, they don't belong. So everyone feels and, comfortable leaving them out. Yes. yes. Okay. And work on look at what a plan. All due respect. Look like. <laughs> what it would look like for virtual students right. back, uh, to participate in extracurricular and co-curricular activities. I'm not saying that's what we're going to do, but look at what a plan would look. Give, give us some pros and cons okay. to that plan. And, and, and we have time, and we've got yeah. a few months to get there. And, and, uh, and there are districts that have allowed them to. This isn't new. Sure. This isn't new. Yep. You know? right. So we don't have to necessarily recreate the wheel on this deal. Right. Right. I, I have so, a question. Yeah. On, on, um, just on that legislation that's in there, how, how does a private school or a charter school come into play along with virtual? I know we're talking about homeschool or whatever, but I mean, it's sitting on the governor's desk. He's either going to veto it or pass it. We're going to, there's, there's going to be vouchers. There's going to be private school money. There's going to be charter school money. I mean, do we need to, is that too soon to look at how that comes into play as well? To me, I would not include charter schools or private schools. We may have to at some point in time. But to me, the biggest distinction here, and Dean, you hit on it, is virtual kids are enrolled in the Willow Spring School District. All right? A private school is not. A charter school is not. Okay. And, and they basically, the way that the new legislation is set up, uh, they basically can apply for a scholarship to a private school, and businesses to donate to this fund can get a tax credit that can then take, it'll, it'll cost the state 50 some million dollars or whatever, that can then be funneled to help support kids going to a private school. So it's taking money out of the public coffers and putting it in private hands for kids who decide that they want to go to public school anymore. Uh, so that's that deal. I still believe that this is different. Private schools and charter schools are not the same as virtual kids because they're not actually enrolled in our schools. Right. They're doing their own thing. Yep. Okay. So I can see the distinction with virtual kids. But not homeschool and not, not the private or charters. So anything else? We will work on doing something with that and I'll bring it back hopefully by next month. Okay. okay. All, right. All right, moving on. I know both of you had comments or questions earlier tonight for board policy. We don't allow that during the meeting. Now is the time that we allow comments from our guests. So whatever whatever you've well, got. Actually the first thing yeah, the first thing I was to say is for you, have you ever thought about doing like I know it's a big if, like Faraday cage in the bathroom? You know what I mean, a Faraday cage? Like it basically blocks cell phone signals? Jams, signals, yeah. um, I mean, I'm not saying signal, signal how jammers. you do this. We, we actually have one. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Because sig signal jammers are, um, it's pretty much the consensus that federal law um, makes them illegal. Oh, because I actually had a teacher ask that at a faculty meeting and I knew the answer to it because I had researched it. Because we have truly gotten to that point that we're that desperate. Yeah, if it wasn't illegal, I would have suggested it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've looked into that before also, and that was by, by federal. But yes, we have considered that. <laughs> Why your phone work here? <laughs> Did you have something else? Yes, um, I just have a comment about you know the virtual student because my daughter, my daughters will be a virtual student. So regarding the classes they take, all of the classes are approved by Sharon Patton, the counselor, at the high school. So my oldest, who's taking the classes, she is in honors world history, astronomy, Japanese, honors physical science, honors English and art appreciation and music and digital communications. Everything that is required by the school by the credit hours. So all the classes she's taking is approved by your counselor. And uh, another thing is uh, she does not play around. She gets up at eight o'clock in the morning. She works till 10 at night because she has approximately in a week about 48 assignments that are due on top of everything else. So this is not what's going on. Uh, and also, um, we got, so if you're, when you're planning, it's all approved. And all of these courses that she's taking, they are MASHA approved because when you go to Launch's website, that's what it says. These are the courses, these are not. And she has aspirations. She's, her wishes was she is excelling ex academically. And her thing is that she wants to she feels comfortable and she wants to show her strength as a leader and and as a team player and be an asset to the community. And she interacts with her and she wants to interact with her peers in extracurricular activities. Uh, I visited with Dr. Lori Wilson, this virtual thing. It it was something that is was going to be progressing uh in into our school systems maybe like five years down the road but due to covid it has accelerated and it was here we are so and i think through because of covid a lot of people are going to be there the parents are deciding which way should we go and kids excel and she is a great student and our our second daughter madeline will be enrolling and she's going to be a virtual student both of them are polar opposites Alicia loves, she is task-oriented leader, she'll get it done. Madeline is a social butterfly, so she's like, can I play softball, can I play this, can I do this? And I think both half girls will make Willow Springs a very cool, full thing. And like Marty, last meeting when she was there, she's like, you said that I would like to point out students who are excelling and leaders, and I would point it out, our girls would be in it with the top leadership in any role, in any task that they do, they will excel. I mean, I'm not saying that as our parent, I'm saying that as also a homeschool mom that we never thought we would be doing homeschool, but we did, and um, it's great. And one of the questions when you are putting your stuff together is, our kids have aspirations. I mean, your curriculum is divided into, uh, are you going to school or college? They're in the track for college. So my question comes up to the board is, is she going to be eligible for scholarships that you are giving out to your seniors? Because if she's virtual, is she just not gonna be? All her hard work is just going to be put aside? You know, so those are the questions that the board needs to answer. Because she is going to be one of the Excel students. And, and, and also, I do agree with you, and I appreciate you saying that I think the biggest job in this room, as parents, as workers and everything is, we cannot exclude kids. And as Ms. Pence says, this is a very difficult time. Kids are trying to figure out who they are. And if you're saying, oh, you're a homeschooler, you're whatever, we are, both my husband and I are in the healthcare field. A doctor doesn't say, you take holistic medicine, I'm not gonna treat you. You know, you're here, you need help. Kids are the same thing. They're here to, for an education. We're to provide them with it. You can't say you're a homeschool student, whatever. We are a resource and they need to just come to us. And I hope that Willow will be like that. That every kid would not be turned around just because the choices were made. You know, the, you know, you won't be like, oh, you're a vegan, go sit at that table. You eat steak. We just say, okay, that's what we do. We make it, let's go. 
And that's what we need to do. We cannot separate the kids at this time. It is so crucial because that's one of the biggest things. She's like, Mom, I worked so hard. Why can't I do this? You know, the only thing is she's like, oh, well. And then we were told we need to go to Willow Springs. Oh, no, we have to go to West Plains in order to do extracurricular activities. Why would we do that when she's part of the school? She's enrolled in the school. The counselors decide her classes, you know? She's only, she's taking it virtually because that is what is best for our family and the situation. But she works really hard and I think, I understand there's, you know, there's no easy way, but they're excellent students, so, and we should not be dismissing them. Thank you, and we are, working on it to see yes. what, what options we can I explore. appreciate that. Because mm -hmm. that's our other question. What's going to happen when she comes to scholarships sure. in senior year? That's a good question. Because when she's applying for colleges, they're looking for what her activities are. And she can't show that she's a leader because she did not have an opportunity. She's like, am I going to put, I mean, she's always thinks, you know, she's, this is, she's a freshman, but she's already thinking about it as senior year. When I'm applying for colleges, what should I say? My school board did not allow me to participate in activities, so therefore I don't have anything. Sure. So, should she put that on there? I don't have an answer for that. No. <laughs> but we will. No, that's okay. But we'll have but an answer. It's, I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? I just have a comment to make, and I don't know when considering that if we, um, we have the residential facility on campus now that our students participate in that we need to be thinking about what doors are opening for our Ozark Trail students as well. They're all considered distance learners. and. Um, Right now, they have close to 20 students that are not on our campus for various numbers of reasons. What what avenues and doors we're opening up if we do that for those students as well? Okay. Very good. With that, I would. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, item fraction. Um, we're gonna scratch item A. And we're going to move on to item B. Um, we had a proposal to move girls softball from a fall to a spring sport. A motion would be in order to approve that uh, plan. So moved. Colleen, in a second. Very good. So, uh, was that Adam? Adam. Sounds good. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 And opposed? Sounds like we'll be playing softball in the. <laughs> 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 Uh, it's time to approve our membership with MSBA for 21-22. Yeah, you've actually already approved the claim, but we'll go ahead and uh, let's do a motion to make it sound good. <laughs> Best money we ever spent. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, All that, in favor? No, sorry. Matt, I have the motion, yes. By Dean, <laughs> do I have a second? Second. By Mac. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 And opposed? Very good. Yeah, don't ever stop approving that. No. And most definitely don't ever stop approving the policy development. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can't have the policy without this, though. I think yeah, right. you got to be a member. Yeah. So yeah. You, yeah. Can't, you can't just buy the policy and not be a member. <laughs> this is just their way of charging you extra exactly. for the policy. Right. Exactly. No, they are that's handy that. with other stuff. I've yeah. called them. I'm sure some of you have called them at times <laughs> for, for items information. It just, just makes it easy. Um, we need. I, I didn't know we need another work session. Well, it's a budget work session. Okay. It's a budget work session. Yeah, I, I would uh, request to the board that we set uh, Thursday, May 27, 2021, 5:30 p.m. for a budget work session to kind of talk about the FY22 budget. Okay. Anybody like to make that motion? Nobody wants one. Nobody wants to talk <laughs> about the budget. I'll make that. Really? I was just checking my calendar. <laughs> I didn't even think to check my calendar. Do I have a second? Sounds like crickets. Was that you, Matt? Second by Matt. Any discussion? How long will it last? Always. Oh, you gonna, gonna put me down? Depends on how many questions you ask, Dane. No less than 30 minutes and no longer than three hours. That's All right. And I promise to make it as exciting no as you, I, I promise to make it as exciting as a budget can be. So. All right. I've we'll got a motion food. to Don't second. get the food, man. All in favor, aye. 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 And opposed? That was a very unenergetic yeah. group of eyes. <laughs> 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 530. Uh, Dean and Matt 530. Second. What were you doing over here? You on your uh, phone? She was on her phone. I, 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 wonder why we're having I, told her just, I told her make sure you bring food because that will get them here. So. All right. Anything else for open session <laughs> no, tonight? No wraps. No. 
I receive a motion to go into executive session. Oh, wait. What? I was already on that. I removed. Has I removed. Um, Adam, in a second. Second. And that. Do that by roll call. Aye. 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 Very good. We are in executive session. Thank you all for coming tonight. Do you need any administrators for? I need Dr. Spencer. Thanks for coming.